Great, Doug is alive, that's good to know. All right, good, I've got an audience. Um, so let's get stuck in. As always, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the comments. It might take me a little, uh, few seconds to see them and there's a short delay, 10 or 15 seconds or so between you typing a comment and it showing up, but I will keep an eye out for them. Um, also, uh, we have the, um, the key questions document, um, key questions for this class. Uh, for this particular subject, this is available on Moodle. The lecture slides are up on Moodle as well, so I'll give you a pointer of um, when those ones come up. Um, and uh, those key questions will form part of your examinable material. Uh, speaking of examinable material, we've had marks for the uh, the first assignment of published FDL grades, and some feedback has been provided on uh, Moodle. I think the second um, assignment has also been marked now. Um, I haven't pulled the marks into FDL grades, but um, both your, um, uh, what, do we, what do we call them? We had the economic cost delay exercise assignment um, and the, um, uh, what was your second assignment for this subject? Oh, that's right, the traffic survey assignment. Those have been marked. So jump on Moodle and check your feedback for those. Um, the road safety audit, um, it's probably worth mentioning. So I sent an email out. Uh, earlier this week uh, because uh, I picked the Victoria Street intersection, uh, also Victoria Park intersection, um, not exactly at random. I sort of looked at, at the map and went, yeah, that's probably a spot that could do with um, some improvement if it was uh, if it had high enough volumes. I was completely unaware that the city of Ballarat were actually um, working on an upgrade there. So um, it will mean that physically visiting the site is not really practical at the moment, um, but the good thing is that I have been able to get the plans from the city of Ballarat for the roundabout that they're planning to build. So after you've all submitted that assignment, we'll be able to go through the actual plan and we'll be able to talk about some of the, the differences between um, the horrible mock-up that I've drawn with lots of deliberate safety mistakes in it um, and the, um, the more traditional, um, you know, better product that the city of Ballarat are building presently. Um, Okay, there's nothing else that I want to mention presently. Um, right, let's get stuck into today's uh, subject. Um, so today we're going to be talking about intersection design in our first topic. Um, we'll talk about roundabouts, which we've talked about a bit before. Um, we'll also talk about um, site distance, we'll talk about benefit cost ratios. Um, we'll talk a bit about um, some of the, the, the channelizations of so some of the islands that go into um, each part of these. Um, these roundabouts and, and various other uh, traffic islands to give us the sort of best layouts possible. Um, and in our second topic today, uh, we'll sort of continue talking about um, intersections um, and, uh, and talk about some of the other functions that they can, uh, some of the other ways that we can think about them functioning. So let's get stuck in. Um, yep, today we'll talk about types, intersections, we'll talk about design criteria, so what sort of things are we looking at? Um, when we are picking out different intersections, what um, we've talked a bit about turning lane warrants before, but now we'll talk about the different triggers for um, signalised intersections, triggers for roundabouts. Um, we'll also look at sight distance. So um, sight distance is a concept that you might be able to tell what it is just from the, the two words together, but basically that's how far you can see um, along the road, and it has some technical um, requirements, so there's certain minimum heights. If you're looking over a crest or around a bend, um, there are uh, certain requirements as to how much clearance uh, from the, the road surface you have, um, and those are all based on um, the sort of the average car on the road or the 95th percentile car on the road. Um, and uh, we'll talk about operation of signalised intersections. So how do um, signalised intersections um, function, what, how are they designed, um, and what sort of um, uh, hardware actually goes into making signalised intersections function the way that we expect they would. Uh, so broadly to start off with, we've got two main types of intersection which we can see um, in the picture here. Um, the first First one up here, this is a grade separated intersection. Um, so by grade, we mean um, the, the sort of level of the road. Um, so you can have a, a shallow grade or a steep grade if you're climbing up a hill. Um, that's, that's sort of describing the road surface. Here, we have a separated grade because we have one grade up here um, going from say east to west and one road that's going from um, north to south. 
And they're separated in time, uh, sorry, they're separated in space. So um, there's two ways that we can allow traffic to pass through an intersection without a collision. Um, one is to separate the, um, the vehicles in space. Here we have um, a vertical space between vehicles traveling one direction and vehicles traveling another. And down here we have an at grade intersection, so all the roads come together at the same grade. Um, and here we try to avoid collisions by separating the vehicles in time. So down here vehicles can operate, the, uh, can occupy the same space, but we separate them in time so that they don't have a collision. Up here they operate, they can occupy the same uh, time, but they will not occupy the same space because they're going to be physically separated. So that's that's the main difference. Grade separated intersections uh, and at grade intersections. Um, you can obviously imagine that a grade separated intersection is much, much more expensive to construct. Uh, we need concrete structures. Um, we need to service these structures. So um, a bridge structure like this is millions of dollars worth of infrastructure. That's not accounting all of the ramps that lead up to, because we need to make the height difference between the two roads. So all of these earthen batters, these are constructed. Uh, we need to maintain the bridge. So we have to inspect and maintain it. And there are limits on the mass that we can put over this bridge. So we always prefer, and you can see here we have the National Highway, this is the Western Highway um, here, we always prefer the main National Highway um, typically to go under the, uh, the overpass because that means we don't have any weight restrictions. If we need to move an overmass load, something that's like 600 tons or more, then we can do it on the main carriageway. The trade-off is that we might have a height restriction. So maybe that 600 ton load, which might be a, a generator or something, or a, a transformer for a power station, um, that might also be too high to pass under this. So sometimes we have a, um, uh, we prefer the, the National Highway to pass over if it's for height restrictions, or pass under for weight restrictions. Typically under is better, but we can, um, Often if we've got ramps, so it's not shown in this picture, but I'll, I'll bring up a, a Google Maps image to, um, uh, to show what I'm talking about. Um, if we have ramps that go around, then we can still get our overmass vehicles um, past them. So here, here we have the Western Freeway, and there is an overpass here. So um, the, which highway is this? Dalesford Road. Dalesford Road goes over the Western Freeway. But if you want to move something that's too tall to fit under the Western Freeway, to too tall to fit under the bridge here, then the vehicles can take this exit ramp and they can follow the exit ramp across. They can use the re-entry ramp. So an oversized vehicle can still um, get along and an overweight vehicle that isn't too tall could just stay on the Western Freeway the whole way along. So. That's grade separated and at grade intersections. We can break down at grade intersections further into a few of the categories here. Um, and your very first key lecture question uh, is on this slide. How is an at grade intersection different from a grade separated intersection? I hope you all can answer that now. So types of at grade intersections. We have a T intersection, um, which we can see here in, um, in street view and in um, satellite view. Um, it's a T because it forms a sort of T shape. Right angle bend, um, it's, it's a three leg intersection, so there's a main road uh, and a secondary road that intersects the main road. Um, and this is not a bad arrangement because it's pretty clear if you're on the secondary road who has priority. It's clear that because Slady Creek Road is continuous, that is the road with more priority. And Rose Hill Road, as long as there is appropriate signage leading up to Slady Creek Road, you know that it is discontinuous. You usually have in here, you can just sort of see a black and white chevron sign that marks the end of the road. Um, and, uh, and so it's pretty clear that if you're approaching from Rose Hill Road, you need to give way. Um, if we have high volumes, we can channelize parts of the road. So here we have a few different channelization arrangements. We can have a channelized right turn, a CHR. So this gives us space to pull into the right and to wait. And it allows vehicles to pass vehicles that are waiting as they wait for a gap in vehicles coming the other way. So it's a channelized right turn. We can have a channelized left turn. So this is 
Um, it gives us space to pull over and decelerate. We don't have to wait for anyone here, but we can decelerate, we can slow down off the main carriageway. If we don't have this, you can see if here in Slady Creek Road, we don't have any uh, channelized left turns. So if there are two vehicles following and the front vehicle wants to turn left, the front vehicle has to slow down to 20 or 30 k's an hour before they can safely make the turn and the vehicle behind them has to slow down as well. It might be safe to overtake if they can see, um, but it's less safe than if there was a channelized left turn. Um, we can also have these channelized exits on the minor road. So we can have a channelized left and a channelized right. Um, and this helps to improve the flow of vehicles out of the main road, uh, sorry, out of the side road, because there is, um, there is not that need for um, vehicles wanting to turn left uh, to wait behind vehicles that want to turn right. It usually takes longer to turn right because you have to cross two streams of traffic or cross one stream to enter a second stream. Turning left is usually a bit faster. So separating the streams like this, we get a better efficiency. So channelization, it really helps to regulate traffic. It helps to direct the conflicting traffic streams. It improves safety and it improves traffic flow. But you must build more pavement and you must build uh, more concrete in the islands to make this work. A sort of a variant of a T intersection is a Y intersection. Uh, now Y intersections are much less safe. Um, it is easy for a driver to confuse priority in a Y intersection. This is an example of um, an a Y intersection on Kilmore Lancefield Road and off here this is Old Lancefield Road. And most of the time you'd be pretty confident you're coming off of a road here with um, uh, gravel shoulders with a narrow seal with not much line marking. So you're pretty, you know you're on the, the minor road. But if you're coming up to a road that's a dirt road, um, particularly if it's a dirt road that doesn't, well, you can't have any line marking on a dirt road, um, then it can be quite hard to tell. Um, I couldn't find one that was, that was a nice clear example of of a proper Y intersection. This is a cross intersection, but you see the same uh, high angle of approach. It can be not only hard to see that there are vehicles approaching on other legs, but it can be hard to see who would have priority. In theory, everyone should slow down and give way to everyone because there's no line marking and we don't know what to do. But in practice, sometimes people think, oh yeah, that guy's going straight, I'm going left, no worries. Um, and there happens to be a bit of a miss a misalignment between what people think the other driver is going to do and what they actually do, and it can cause a collision. So Y intersections um, are definitely not preferred. There are lots of cases around the state where um, Y intersections still exist on very low volume roads, but most of the Y intersections that exist on medium or high volume roads, they have already been converted to a sort of a T intersection to improve safety. So your second key lecture question is how is a Y intersection different from a T intersection and which type of intersection is safer? I hope you can answer that now. Um, a typical intersection that you probably think of whenever the word intersection pops into your head would be this kind of a four leg intersection. Um, it's a reasonably even merging of traffic. Usually, um, Signalized intersections can function well whether we have a, uh, an even or an uneven volume. So whether it's a minor road and a major road that, um, that are meeting together. We can provide channelization. So here we've got channelized uh, slips. This is an, I guess, overseas road because we've got channelization of a right turn there and here for the slip lanes. So this picture should be reversed really. In fact, I think it actually works fine if we go in here and mirror it. Um, because you can sort of immediately uh, make it Australian just by doing this. The text doesn't make any sense now, but now you can see all the turns are on the right side of the road. All the lefts are where they should be, all the rights are where they should be. So um, the channelization, as we said before, helps to improve flow. It means that people wanting to turn left don't have to stop at the lights. Um, we've got a double right turn here. So sometimes we have a high demand for a particular volume of movement. We need to make sure we've got enough storage space so that people wanting to turn right don't block the intersection further back. We've also got separated medians. So we've got a concrete median. The median is planted with trees in this area. We've got curb on both sides. Um, and this 
is a very good visual improvement to the road. It's also a safety improvement, as you can imagine. By physically separating drivers, um, there's less chance of a head-on collision, but we need to make sure that any trees planted um, in the road space are small enough that they're not a hazard to vehicles. Um, while I'll move on to the next slide, but um, while I do, um, please type out what you think the largest diameter of tree or the largest diameter of, of say, a wooden uh, block is safe to have in a road reserve. We'll see what you guys think and then I'll, I'll respond to those comments in a minute. So the largest diameter of, of tree to be safe uh, in a road reserve. And we'll say, um, say about 80 k's an hour for the speed limit. Um, so we can have uh, a four-leg intersection as we just seen, but there's many places in the state, particularly uh, in Melbourne, where a lot of roads meet in a, uh, a very big cluster. Now, when roads were first built as a um, and, and speeds were much lower in sort of um, uh, you know, horse and cart type of, of travel, this would have been a great place to have a market or a meeting or a very convenient place to meet. But now that we're trying to travel at greater speeds and our, um, our philosophy around road use has changed, these intersections are quite difficult to navigate um, and they are potential sort of black spot approaches. So a multi-leg intersection, this is looking at five or more approaches. You can see here we've got many roads uh, intersecting. Um, and we really should avoid them if we can. If, if possible, we want to try and bring one of the legs of the intersection across to meet, um, a, meet a, a separate intersection. Um, say here where we've got this, I'm not sure if this is a park uh, or some sort of open land, but if we could bring this major road, the, the Princess Highway, um, across to meet here. We probably wouldn't move the Princess Highway, but um, um, if we were to say move Police Road so that it met with the Princess Highway at a different angle, um, we could tidy up this so that it wasn't such a complicated intersection arrangement. Um, so we should always, if we are going to realign alignments, these multi-leg alignments, we should always be trying to um, realign the minor road um, so we should move, if there's this diagonal leg, again, the Princess Highway would typically have a higher priority, but it, assume that this wasn't a highway, um, assume that it was, these were all at grade roads, um, then we should try to bring the diagonal leg into a line onto a minor road, um, and that we should separate enough distance between the intersections um, so that they can still function. Um, Doug has asked, does the Vic Park intersection count as a four leg or a multi leg? Um, it's, uh, it, it's probably something that, um, yeah, we are talking about the base of a tree, uh, Joel and, and Jessica. Um, so the, the base, the sort of, if, uh, if the trunk of the tree, that's, that's what we're, we're uh, looking at for the maximum size. Um, and yeah, I'd say that the Vic Park intersection, again, I'll jump out of the slides and go back to here. The Vic Park intersection has uh, the makings of a multi-leg intersection for sure. Uh, where are we up here? Because, um, Although Cedar Drive and Poplar Avenue, um, they form the main intersection, Quercus is close enough that it really can function like a multi-leg. Um, and what I mean by that is that it, it has this sort of, um, this extra complexity that makes it harder for drivers to, to take in all the visual information. It makes it easier for drivers to make mistakes. So how do we uh, realign these roads? Well, this is how we would do it. You have the old alignment of the multi-leg intersection and you bring the old road across so that it meets at a different point. Here we have a big multi-leg intersection uh, and we would prefer to bring this into a new alignment and separate these. But if there are houses here, this is very hard to do. It's very expensive because we have to buy all of the houses. So um, yeah, we're looking at a lot of the time whenever something like this is done, um, there's tens of millions of dollars worth of work um, and a big chunk of that money is in property acquisition. Um, okay, so we've got a few of the comments about um, the tree base. So Doug said 300 millimeters. Jeremy thinks a bit bigger at 500 millimeters. A uh, few people have said 400 millimeters. Um, uh, that's uh, reasonable guesses. Um, so if you sort of picture 300 millimeters, that's about the length of a standard kindergarten ruler. Um, that a tree that thick will will stop a car uh, in its tracks. 
quite comfortably. Um, for a, a tree to be considered safe in the road reserve, it needs to be something that's going to completely break when the, the car hits it. Um, and not just hit it, the car can't just hit it front on, we need the car to be able to hit this thing sideways and for the tree still to break. So um, if you put your uh, your sort of thumbs together and your um, your middle fingers together and make a sort of circle, that's close to a hundred millimeter diameter, depending on the size of your hands, I guess. Um, but a hundred millimeter diameter, that's the uh, the biggest size tree that we can have in the road reserve without some sort of protection. Any new trees that get planted, um, if it's above a 60k an hour zone or even at 60, um, any new trees that get planted need to have a, a sort of a lifetime growth of 100 millimeters. Um, and that's, as we said, for vehicle safety. All right, let's jump in and talk about roundabouts. So we've talked about these a few times before, but we'll have a bit more of a um, a chat um, covering off some of what we've already covered and then we'll go into a, to some new areas of discussion. Um, so we know roundabouts function um, circulating clockwise. Um, in other parts of the world where you drive on the other side of the road, um, it's reversed um, and it can be, it's probably one of the most confusing things if you've ever been to Europe um, or uh, to America and you've had to drive um, on the right instead of on the left. Um, Probably, you know, it doesn't take you long to get used to driving on the other side of the road, but roundabouts still are very confusing um, because everything that you're used to is reversed um, and it's, uh, it's quite tricky. Um, but uh, the, the good thing about roundabouts is that they, they physically control the speed of vehicles um, and they do it in a few ways. So you can sort of see here we have a curve before we get into the roundabout, then we have a curve in the roundabout itself, um, and then we have a straight section leaving the roundabout. Um, sometimes there'll even be a third curve before the roundabout if we're in a high speed environment. And all of these curves are carefully chosen. Um, there, the radius of the curves is designed to um, bring drivers down in speed as they want to they want to comfortably navigate. They don't like to feel too much sideways friction. So as they see the curve coming up, the driver naturally will slow from 80 to 60, from 60 to 40, and then we'll, we'll cruise around the roundabout um, at 40 or 30 k's an hour. The straight section, the tangent exiting the roundabout, this is designed because for maximum efficiency of the roundabout, we want people, as soon as they've exited the roundabout, we want them to accelerate. We want them to get back up to speed. And so we have a straight sections leaving the roundabout, as you can see on all exits. Um, so your question number three in the key questions, how do roundabouts control the speed of vehicles um, entering the circulating stream? It's a physical control. It's not like a sign that asks you politely to slow down. Um, it's not like uh, you know enforcement where there's police present. There is a physical control of speed by the, the nature of the curb and channel and the road shape. It physically controls speed of vehicles and that's why, one of the reasons why roundabouts are so safe, that physical control, you can't ignore it. You can't um, forget that it's there. It, uh, it really um, forces you to, uh, you know, even if you're trying to be a race car driver, you have to slow down to get through these things. Another good thing is the angle of incidence. We talked about this before. If a vehicle entering here collides with someone who's already in the roundabout, there's a very shallow angle between the two vehicles. Um, and so they kind of just bounce off each other. Um, there's not that kind of um, sharp crumpling, um, that, uh, that severe damage and that severe change in momentum um, that, that is quite hazardous to vehicle occupants. When two vehicles are traveling in mostly the same direction and they collide, the acceleration, the forces on the human body are very small. Um, yeah, you're going to uh, you know, scratch up your quarter panel on the side of the car, but um, that's, that's you know, a much more preferable outcome to damaging the, the occupants of the vehicle. Roundabouts come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Um, some of you might recognize this roundabout um, in, uh, towards the center of Melbourne. If you're approaching Melbourne from the, um, uh, the northwestern suburbs, um, you'll be coming in through I forget exactly the name of, of, uh, of these streets, but um, you might recognize just because it's, it's one of the most confusing um, intersections going around. This is a roundabout, yes, but it also has tram lines going through the middle of it, and it has signalization for parts of it. So there's a stop line, holding line there, there's a stop line here, there's a stop line here, and there's a stop line there. Um, 
However, this is um, you know, a significant improvement over some other alternatives that, that you could imagine might exist. An uncontrolled intersection is obviously going to be terrible here. Uh, an intersection that has um, you know, multi-leg uh, with just signals is still going to be much harder to navigate um, than the roundabout, which at least provides us some protection um, and control of, of uh, speed. Um, now, we've also discussed the fact that while roundabouts are quite safe for vehicles, they are typically less safe for cyclists. Uh, and that's just because um, it can be quite hard as a cyclist if you're trying to um, get around a roundabout, um, you have to cross over multiple exits. You're typically traveling slower than the drivers uh, who are in the roundabout. Drivers often feel that they have a right to overtake cyclists when they probably shouldn't within roundabouts, and that can be one of the most dangerous things. There often isn't enough width to safely overtake a cyclist um, through a roundabout, but when drivers try to do so, it's, um, it really uh, infringes on the amount of space that's there for safety. So um, that's, uh, that's one of the, the drawbacks. They're not perfect. Um, they're also not good for pedestrians, um, but very good for for um, uh, vehicles. James has asked, is this the Royal Melbourne Hospital roundabout? I think you might be right. Uh, yeah, I think you are actually. Let's look it up. Royal Melbourne Hospital. It is. Yeah, and that's that one there. So that's, yeah, that's the Royal, Royal uh, Women's, Royal Melbourne. Um, um, and, uh, and this is that roundabout we were just looking at. Well spotted, James. And, and thanks for confirming, Hayden. Um, just have a quick look at, these are some of the, the geometric elements of a roundabout. We obviously have a central island, which is a, um, a prime feature um, of the, the roundabouts. Um, sometimes roundabouts will have a second annulus. So if I go to back to Ballarat um, and take a look at some of the roundabouts constructed out near the Ballarat West Employment Zone. Um, you can see that there is the main um, centre annulus. So we've got this curb and channel here. Then we've got an outer section and then there's this little lip. Um, so this is provided for, uh, for truck movements. So um, typically if this was a smaller roundabout we might just have um, the, the island uh, in the centre, the centre um, radius, it might just have curb and channel around it, and very small roundabouts are also typically concrete infill. Um, but here we've got this, this little um, concrete apron, so that if a truck is going around with, say, a B-double trailer attached, the trailer can run on the inside edge. Um, but typically a driver of a, of a passenger vehicle um, sees the concrete, they see the tiny little lip, and they don't touch it. They stay um, in a wider arc, and by staying in a wider arc going around the roundabout, they are um, keeping to more, uh, it's keeping to a better angle in the case of a potential impact. They're also um, typically, um, by giving them a narrower lane, they're more controlled in their speed as well. Um, if you need heavy vehicles to get around sm very small roundabouts, we can take the example of the roundabout um, closer to, not Grant Street, where is it? It's over here somewhere. Um, at the end of uh, at the end of Geelong Road, um, so we have uh, this little roundabout from Main Road up to Humphrey Street, um, and this one is um, fully concrete. It's also fully mountable, so you can see the vehicle marks going over this as vehicles, um, say coming up Main Road, need to make a right turn. It's a very sharp turn. Uh, passenger vehicles can do this fine. But heavier vehicles, they just mount the roundabout, and they're able to, to move uh, fine through there. So we've got the, uh, the center island. Um, the diameter is a function of what sort of vehicles we want to get around um, that intersection. It's also a function of how much space we've got. We physically can't um, install very large roundabouts as much as we would like to in all places. Um, we have uh, an exit tangent, maybe a slight exit curve. We have several curves on approach. So um, as I mentioned before, depending on the speed environment, um, we'll have uh, two or three curves um, 
slowing the vehicle down as they come into the roundabout to circulate around. Um, between two legs, now this is true whether we have a roundabout or whether it's a different kind of intersection, we will have a curb which is straight here, we have a curb which is straight here in these two roads, and between the, the two roads where they're joined up, we have what's called a curb return. Um, and this is, as I said before, the same whether it's um, talking about a roundabout or whether it's talking about um, a, a multi-leg intersection or a cross intersection, the join between curbs on multiple legs is called a curb return. Um, the holding line, this is where we, we hold vehicles before entering, and splitter islands are very helpful to have that physical protection between vehicles uh, exiting and entering the roundabout as well. Don't need to worry about labeling um, a roundabout. I'm not going to ask you to label a roundabout or anything like that. Uh, just wanted to uh, point out a few of those things so that you've got a bit of an idea about the terminology. Um, all right, so what are some of the design principles for at-grade intersections? Here we've got an intersection um, which is in Horsham. It's been modified recently, and I'll show the modified picture shortly. Um, but I thought this was a good opportunity to talk about what we typically try to do. So what we want to do in uh, at-grade intersections is we want to minimize the frequency and severity of potential conflicts. Uh, we want to try and control the different traffic streams. Uh, we want to control the movement of pedestrians and turning vehicles. Um, and we want to first, firstly, minimize frequency and severity of, of conflicts, but then we also want things to function well. We want there to be an efficient flow um, of vehicle movements as well, um, because both of those things are, um, are important to the, a good road network um, in terms of our sort of economic benefits to the state. So having a look at this intersection here, there's lots of flow options. There's some vehicles that want to turn left straight out of this, this straight section. And, I, and you can see there's a river or a bit of a creek back here. So this goes straight over a bridge for a little while, straight over a bridge on this side. So vehicles are typically approaching this intersection at high speed. Um, and then they're coming out to the left, um, which, you know, that's a high speed left movement that's sort of OK on its own. But the potential for vehicles using this roundabout to do a U-turn here um, this means that U-turning vehicles, whether they're coming from this lane or from this lane, um, from these different streets within Horsham, um, they have the potential to be given a side impact from a high-speed vehicle travelling here. If you want to do a U-turn and come out this way or turn right out this way, um, you've got this high-speed impact if vehicles don't see. Especially because this is two lanes on approach, you have the potential for um, a truck or a van or some other high vehicle blocking line of sight from a second vehicle on approach. They do a head check, but all they see is the van. They think, yeah, there's nothing coming. They come out here and there's a side impact. So there were lots of crashes here. Um, there was uh, you know, good efficiency of flow, but not good safety. So the intersection was redesigned and it now looks uh, looks like this. This is called something like the, the turbo teardrop. I think it was, um, it was uh, affectionately named. Um, yeah, Joel and Jessica have said that they live in Horsham. It was always a worry at that intersection. Um, yeah, it's um, uh, it definitely wasn't um, wasn't a very good arrangement to begin with. And while it was quite controversial, um, this new alignment has significant safety improvements over what was there previously. So, for a start, it's removed that potential for a high speed impact from right turning vehicles. So you now can't possibly uh, make that collision. You also can't make a collision between vehicles that want to go straight over the roundabout and vehicles that are coming straight from the other leg. So if you look previously, here we had vehicles that needed to give way when they entered. They had a short distance and then there was another merge uh, and these vehicles needed to give way. Um, in the present condition, by creating this, um, this concrete median and separating the lanes, um, these vehicle streams are made to zip merge further down. Um, Joel perhaps, and Jessica, perhaps you can um, you can tell us a bit more about uh, whether you think this this intersection has been an improvement. Um, but I, I think that from the the way it's laid out now, um, it's uh, it's achieving some of the aims um, of at grade intersections. So um, if you see uh, your key lecture question four, what are the two main objectives of designing at grade intersections? We have the two here to minimize the frequency and severity of potential conflicts, and we also want to provide efficient flow of traffic. Um, and yeah, Joel and Jessica said absolutely better, 
which yeah, I, I'm I'm glad that you uh, you agree. It's very controversial. Um, road design. So uh, as I mentioned before, I, I work for the state road authority. Um, there are literally um, tens of thousands of people that use every intersection um, that you might consider a change to, um, and they tens of thousands of people use it every day. So the chance for people to um, to dislike what you're doing um, and be very loud and, and vociferous about what they dislike is very high. The people who are happy typically go, oh, that's great, and they don't say anything about it. Um, Joel has, uh, oh, sorry, Doug has asked, would that have improved the intersection for pedestrians? So we have a pedestrian crossing here and a little pedestrian shelter here, um, which this one's not too bad, but this one's very short, which is not too good. And I think this is a pedestrian walkway as well. Um, in the new condition, we have um, a formalized crossing point. We have um, audio tactile uh, line, mark not audio tactile, sorry, um, uh, the, the tactile line marking for the blind. Um, and we have wider spaces here for pedestrians as well. So space for um, the typical standard is for a pedestrian uh, with a pram to cross the road, um, proper pram ramps. Yes, I think this would have been a, a significant improvement for pedestrian safety as well. Um, some other things to note, so um, we need to look at the operating characteristics for vehicles and pedestrians using an intersection. Um, we want to make sure that we are factoring in um, the speeds of both of those road users um, and their desire lines. We also want to make sure that we ideally don't locate intersections that are just beyond sharp vertical curves or sharp horizontal curves. So that makes it quite difficult to see that an intersection is coming. And yes, there's signage, we can have intersection ahead concealed intersection, but um, signage and line marking are always the lowest hierarchy of controls um, because there's so many things that can go wrong. People can simply not see the signage. The signage could be knocked over or vandalized. Um, and with, if the signage is all that you're depending on, uh, it's, it's a bit like um, a paper shield in Game of Thrones. It's better than nothing, but it's not a lot. Um, so how do we set about designing at grade intersections? So we need to look at a few, um, a few features. Um, we need to design the alignment of an intersection. This is how uh, all the things are going to be physically laid out. Um, we need to think about how we're going to channelize um, the, the intersection for traffic movements. <coughs> what sort of channels are we going to use that will prevent um, vehicles from colliding um, in a way that we don't want. Obviously, we don't want vehicles to collide, but we also want to um, allow all the vehicle movements that, that need to be made. So here you can see an example of um, a semi-trailer making movements through, and we've got an out and an in um, shown here from whatever intersection this is. Now, um, the out movements um, and the in movements, we would like to separate those with an island, but if the swept path, if the, the vehicle uh, wheels of this um, semi-trailer go over where we would put an island, then our options are somewhat limited. As discussed before, we can install a fully mountable island, um, but that's uh, not as good as, as something that provides a bit more barrier protection. Um, this movement here as well, this is shown with a program called Auto Turn. There are lots of um, variations of this, but basically what Auto Turn and other similar products do is they let you um, put a vehicle in your CAD model and click around your CAD model to make the vehicle drive. You can also steer with the keyboard um, and do like a real-time tracking thing, but it typically um, it's really hard to control doing that. Um, your keyboard is not really well set up for, for steering. Um, it'd almost be better if you had a joypad or a, a steering wheel that you could play around with. Um, but uh, but at least by clicking around your CAD model, you're able to then, the, the program will calculate what happens to the trailer um, following a vehicle or what happens to, even if it's just a pedestrian vehicle, a single rigid vehicle, it shows you um, how tight that vehicle can turn to the Australian standards. So what is the minimum turning radius of the passenger vehicle or the, the heavy vehicle, whatever it happens to be. It then also shows you the swept path. That is, where does the body of the vehicle sweep and it shows you in a separate line group where the wheels sweep. So for instance, um, buses, uh, the city of Ballarat buses, you might have noticed 
there's a bit of an overhang behind the rear wheels and there's an overhang in front of the front wheels of the buses that uh, that get around Ballarat um, and uh, it's it's important that the wheels um, on the bus go round and round. No, I'm kidding. Uh, it's important that the wheels um, don't hit any solid objects in the road. Um, the wheels need to um, you know, avoid hitting curb and channel, um, but the front of the bus can swing over the curb and channel. But anything that's past the curb and channel, we can't put any signs where the front of the bus will swing. So we use both of these line types to design the intersection. Joel and Jessica have asked, can we use this in the audit assignment? Um, you, you don't need to. If you have auto turn and you want to, to play with it, um, I can give you the CAD file that I worked on for the program, um, but it won't be accessible. Um, it's not necessary. In a typical road safety audit as well, it wouldn't be the job of the road safety auditor to do the, um, the turning movements. If this was, uh, I didn't have auto turn at home, so I can't, um, I couldn't do this for the assignment. But typically, you would be, as the road safety auditor, you would be given the auto turn movements that were done by the designer, and so then you can see um, that the, the, you can see where there are any conflicts. So that would actually be one of the things that an auditor would usually review um, as part of their their audit process. Um, so we figure out where all of the, the curve radii are needed. Some curves have standard radiuses. Some curve radiuses are based on uh, the vehicle swept paths, similar to the shape of islands. The shape of traffic islands are almost always based entirely on how the design vehicles sweep through, and the island will cover the largest area that it possibly can while still allowing um, all of the, the movements. Oh, I'm glad to... So Hayden's just said that um, there's vehicle tracking in CAD, and you can get it as a student license. I didn't know that, which is which is great. So I, I would encourage you to play around with it um, if you want, students. Um, I, I'm not. It's not going to be an assessment as part of this course, but it can be quite fun, and it's quite a valuable thing if you're looking for a uh, an engineering job or a design job in future. Um, you know, lots of firms are going to um, need some sort of auto turn experience. To be able to put that on your resume would be quite good. So. Um, uh, by all means, um, if you're if you're interested in doing that, if you want some mock-up CAD plans, um, I can see if I can find some CAD plans for you, uh, and then you can practice those with Auto Turn um, so that you can get a bit of exposure to that. Just send me an email if you're um, if you're interested in if you've got that set up and you want some some CAD bases to work with. Um, so we've checked a few things. We've checked about the alignment. We've checked about the, the shape of, of uh, and widths of different parts of the, um, the space that vehicles are driving on. We also need to check the sight distances. Um, so we need to check that there's appropriate visibility. Um, and these sight distances, there are desirable and, um, and required minimum distances based on the speed environment um, that are given in um, the Australian standards or the Australian Guide to Road Design. Um, this is the intersection in town um, of uh, Joseph Street, coming around the bend here, and I can't remember actually what, um, what the other intersecting street is, so I might just bring it up. Um, where is it in here somewhere? Clayton, I think it's Clayton, Joseph, here we go. Spencer, Joseph and Clayton Street um, in Ballarat, and this is a doozy. In terms of the way that it was initially aligned, it would have been a straight through, multi-leg, straight through, um, and diagonal leg intersection. Um, and uh, and it, so it was, it's still, it still feels quite unsafe, but the way that the geometry of the intersection has been um, altered um, is much, much better than it was in the past. Um, so the best alignment for accurate intersections this is when we have intersecting roads which meet at right angles or close to right angles um, meeting at right angles it has the advantage of um, clearly uh, defining priority if it's a if it's a t type intersection but it also has the advantage of giving you the best visibility um, both ways you're able to look left you're able to look right you're turning your head only 90 degrees um, and that works pretty well um, you might think, oh, well, it doesn't matter too much if I'm not approaching at 90 degrees. You know, I can always turn my head further. Yeah, well, some people aren't as young as you and don't have really good necks. Also, a lot of vehicles um, 
are restricted in where they can look. Trucks can't look out more than 90 degrees. Um, I've, I've got a flatbed ute that I drive around and it's okay most of the time, but if I'm moving um, large objects and I've got them strapped to the back of the ute, I can't see more than 90 degrees out the side of the vehicle. So I have to come up to 90 degrees um, in order to be able to make my head checks and, and make my appropriate movements. Um, so we can see here that we've got um, lots of efforts been made to bring these intersections into, um, to separate the distances between these two, provide a reasonable distance between, um, to bring them into a, a sort of a right angle approach. Um, and all of these things help to improve safety. Um, we also want to avoid uh, short radius horizontal curves. Um, so but by that, what we mean is um, not necessarily that we have a small radius, but that we the, the curve itself is only over a short um, distance uh, because people can not, uh, it takes a bit of gradual turning of the steering wheel to get into a curve and gradual turning to get out. Um, over a short distance, people don't really see them. They can be quite visibly hard to see. Um, and so people can end up in the wrong lanes uh, if they're if they're traveling on that kind of curvature. Doug said he used to live near that intersection. Um, yeah, I now live, um, I have to go quite often between um, a friend's house down this road and my house up further up this road. So I'm, I'm crossing here quite a lot. And um, yeah, I'm tempted to take a more time inefficient route just because this is, is really not a great intersection. As I said, it's about the best that you could do with it. Um, but the visibility is not really good up, up and down. You sort of really make a slow creep. I do about three or four head checks left and then right and then left and then right and really make sure that I'm confident that nothing's coming um, because it's, uh, it's a doozy. Um, and this is, this is an illustration of one of the, the sort of side effects of an intersection that's particularly bad um, is that if people know it's bad, they're more cautious and that can actually lower the crash rate. The worst kind of intersections are dangerous without looking dangerous um, and, uh, and that means that people don't have a high guard um, and they can make mistakes. Question five in your key lecture questions, what are the best alignments for accurate intersections? Uh, right angle or nearly right angle, that's our, our best alignment. So if we have skewed intersections like this, this is similar to the slide we showed before, the dotted line being the way an intersection was aligned, then ideally we want to change it to one of these, one of these arrangements. There's lots of these sort of works going on, old roads that do this, um, that have been changed to, um, to this sort of arrangement instead. Now, um, you might be wondering, as we sort of discussed before, um, if if we've got this sort of arrangement with the road and we want to build a new alignment for the road in here, uh, what do we do if there's um, land here that we don't own? This is where two of the, uh, the sexiest words in the English language uh, come into play, compulsory acquisition. Um, my, some of my favorite terms, um, because when I used to work in the um, private sector, um, you always were constrained by uh, what land you had or what land your client had. And sometimes you needed more land to make the design work, but you were never able to get it. You couldn't buy more land. You were just stuck with what you had. Um, but for the state government and for local government authorities, this is not the case. They have the power of compulsory acquisition. I love saying that. So under the Road Management Act, road management authorities such as the State Road Authority and local councils have the power of compulsory acquisition. This means that they are able to continue the best interests of the state by buying more land, uh, regardless of whether the owner of that land wants to sell it. Now, there are lots of um, requirements about exactly how the, um, the government bodies are meant to go through the process of acquiring land. Um, there are long lead times. We're talking about um, you know, 18, 24, sometimes 36 months um, of lead time um, to, to get the acquisition in place, lots of consultation with the affected landowners. Um, you don't just want to show up on someone's door and serve notice and say, I'm, I'm acquiring some of your land. Um, rather, what's done instead, this, this is um, uh, an alignment shown for the Horsham Bypass. So the bypass um, needs to acquire land somewhere. It's either got to acquire land on the north and east side of Horsham or on the, um, the south 
and west side of Horsham, um, it's got to go close to the town or it's got to go further away from the town. Wherever it goes, it has to buy someone's land and it has to have some impacts. Um, so that's just a, a fact of life. So then the way that it would sort of work is that the planning um, team for the bypass, they will talk to all of the potential landowners on the north, the west, the east, the south side. They'll talk to all the, the owners in the potential um, impact. They'll talk to the council. They'll figure out where, what is going to be the, the net least impact. So you have to impact something, but they try to find what's going to be the minimum impact overall. And they go through various other requirements of you know, um, geometry, there's a certain minimum curve radius that we need to see, there's a certain minimum width for you know, safety, all this sort of stuff. Once they've locked that in, then they're, they're able to um, push ahead because no one can cross their arms and say, well, I'm not selling. There is a power under the, the Road Management Act that says, I'm sorry, I know you don't want to sell. We've done everything we can to minimize the risk. We have to buy your land now. Um, so the landowners are compensated. They receive a financial compensation based on market rates, but they're not able to negotiate or refuse. Um, they can't refuse to sell. They can, um, sometimes there's a bit of give and take. You want people to be cooperative um, because you don't want delays. Uh, so people can, if they're pushy, they can still sort of delay you or they can appeal to ministers or that sort of thing. So you usually, you do a bit of give and take. We've had people say, um, okay, well this alignment uh, you've avoided my house. And we say, yeah, we, we did avoid your house. We didn't want to knock your house down. They say, no, I don't like that. Please knock my house down so that you have to buy the whole house because I'll move. And so we go, okay, we'll, we'll do that. Sometimes it's possible to do that sort of thing. Um, sometimes people say, you've given me this little sliver of land. Are you hitting two of my dams? And you go, well, we can build a new dam for you. That's not a problem. So there's, again, that give, that, that give and take um, to try and maintain the human aspect in, in these things. Um, but you know, you, when you sort of consider that the Western Highway at the moment cuts through the centre of Horsham, um, it's um, putting you know many tens of thousands of trucks, um, or probably only thousands of trucks on a given day, but thousands of trucks that are travelling from Adelaide to Melbourne through the centre of a busy town. There's noise, there's pollution, there's truck inefficiency for the speed and for their braking and accelerating, um, the safety issues for the town itself. Um, it's um, it's an unfortunate need, but it is important that the, um, the road management authorities have the ability to acquire land like this so that those big improvements can be delivered. Your question six in the key lecture questions is what is compulsory acquisition and when is it needed? Um, so it's needed to, uh, to deliver road improvement works, um, to realign roads is one of the major times. How am I doing for slides? I probably should pick up the pace a bit. I've been um, uh, waxing lyrical somewhat. Um, so I'll pick up the pace uh, and then we'll take a, a break shortly and we'll, uh, we'll come back after 11.30. So we'll press on a little bit longer. Um, so uh, what about the profile of at-grade intersections? So um, when, we look at, when we talk about profile, what we mean is vertical alignment. Um, and if we're designing this uh, vertical alignment of the intersection, we need to make sure that the grade lines that we use help the driver to control the vehicle. Um, now, if we've got a major highway or a major road, we want to make sure that that road stays flat. Any of the roads that need to give way to the major road, it's okay if those roads have a kink in them, but the major highway, that should stay flat and straight and true. Um, and we'll see an example of this on the next slide. So, um, we want to make sure that we are giving us um, lines uh, that are visible, so lines on the edge of the road, lines in the middle of the road, uh, lines across the road. We want to make sure that these are visible clearly to, um, uh, to motorists at all times. We don't want the sudden appearance of an intersection. It needs to be um, sort of telegraphed. We want to really be showing uh, a good distance ahead um, in choosing our horizontal alignment, our vertical alignment. They need to all work together. Um, and we also want to make sure that um, it's clear to motorists um, what lane they need to start in, what lane, what path they need to travel through at an intersection, what lane they need to finish in. Um, we need to make sure that that's as straight and as clear as possible also. So here we've got an example of um, an intersection in a, a subdivision um, near Melton or in Melton. Um, and here you can see AJ Way, this is the major road. 
and yellow gunway, this is a side road that intersects it. And then we've got the long section for both of these roads. So here we've got the AJ Way long section, and you can see the long section is flat. Even where it crosses yellow gunway, the cross section is flat. Where yellow gunway comes up to meet AJ Way, it comes up at a peak. You can see the grade here, the grade of yellow gum way is 3.3%, negative 3.3%. In other words, it's sloping down as it comes up to meet yellow gum way. And that is because the cross fall on AJ way is 3.3%. So the fall along the road surface is 3.3% out. For yellow gum way to meet up with AJ way, it has to have the same cross fall as it meets it. And then it's able to flatten out and have its own, uh, its own surface after that. So, and this is the same principle for um, for basically all major roads. We always want to see this kind of thing happening. Um, question seven in your key questions: How are the major road and minor road vertical alignments shaped? We've just uh, we've just covered that. Um, talking about horizontal curves uh, at at grade intersections. Um, so the design of the curves. We, we typically govern this by the angle of the turn, obviously. We, if we need to make a, um, a very large angle turn, then we're going to need a larger curve. We also um, change the radius of the curve based on the turning speed um, and by the design vehicle. So different, as we mentioned before, different design vehicles have different turning radii that they're able to, to uh, move with. We'll also change this based on traffic volume. So um, we can have at say 80 kilometers an hour, a radius of curvature of 500 uh, meters is acceptable for vehicles up to B doubles. Um, but we, I think we can even go slightly lower than that. Um, but we would prefer to go with a larger curve if we have a high volume, especially a high volume of heavy vehicles for overall comfort and to reduce the risk of something going wrong. Um, like most things in engineering, this is a, a risk-based proposition. Um, the while we might be able to safely navigate um, uh, even with adverse crossfall, a 500 metre radius curve, um, and we can safely navigate that you know, tens of thousands of times, there's always going to be that one time where there's a combination, a poorly timed combination of a driver who's slightly a bit more asleep, um, a cat running across a road, um, uh, you know, a heavy, heavier than usual load on the back of the truck, um, and it can cause a rollover if it also happens to be on a poor uh, or just minimum grade um, or minimum curve radius. So extending those curve radii just gives us a little bit more margin of safety when all of the other things uh, fail us in the road network. I might have mentioned it before, but um, it's worth repeating that typically um, accidents don't happen on a road when just one thing goes wrong. Accidents happen when there is there are multiple things that go wrong at the same time, um, and it's uh, it's. You know, it's a combination of poor lighting and uh, the road is wet and the driver's tired and they're distracted and someone pulls out in front of them without warning. It's all of those things at once. Um, so keep that in mind whenever you're looking at intersections, if you're thinking, oh, well, this looks pretty safe. You've got to try and think about worst case. Um, so we can have um, uh, a few different curves which we might uh, we might use around uh, intersections. Um, a simple curve, um, which is just a circular a part of a circle. Um, a simple curve with a taper. So we can have like a spiral um, entry. I'm not sure if you've if you've covered spiral entries in um, uh, geometric road design. If you've done the um, uh, civil design subject, um, but that's there's a bit of that. Um, in there as well. Um, we can have a three centered compound curve. So um, it was sort of a bit visible actually if I go back a few slides. Mm. You can sort of see here we've got one radius, then there's a sharper radius, then there's another radius as well. So this is sort of an example of the three, three centered curve. And you can even see the tick lines here where the curve is broken. This is one curve. Between that tick line and the tangent, there's a second larger curve. Between this tick line and the tangent, there's a second larger curve as well. Um, so that's what we mean by a, um, a three-centered curve. Um, all of the curves shown here, these are just simple, um, simple one-radius curves. Um, again, we can see a couple of the different options in terms of um, 
you know, making these these curves work. Um, why would we go for something like a uh, multi multiple curve, a compound curve? Well, it has to do with the driver comfort navigating the road. So, um, you know, you if you've driven, you know, well, if you've regardless of whether you've personally driven or not, you've all seen a steering wheel and you understand vaguely how it works. Um, you can't change the steering wheel position um, in discrete increments. You have to make a continuous change. Um, so it makes the most sense if you're traveling um, along a road, you're traveling uh, parallel with the road, and you start to turn the wheel, you're going to start to turn it and start to change your the shape of your travel path um, gradually so you need a larger radius then once you're into the curve already you can you can keep turning and you can make a sharper turn and then as you're leaving you can back the wheel off the other way to come back to straight again um, so all the while that that triple um, uh, pointed curve or, or on a very large road a spiral transition curve they just help you go from um, a an a radius of infinity down to a finite radius and then back to a radius of infinity by a radius of infinity, I mean a straight road. So I hope that's clear. Let me know if there's any questions. Okay, um, hope you enjoyed that break. So um, let's talk a bit about some of the forces on a vehicle. And you're probably um, you're probably aware vaguely about um, what happens to a um, an object when it moves in a circular path. Um, so whether it's a, um, a weight on the end of a string that you're spinning in a circle, um, or whether it's a vehicle going around a curve, you've probably come across some sort of physics problem before where um, you note that the change of direction towards the center of the circle is an acceleration. If there's an acceleration and the body has mass, there must be a force. Um, and so we see that vehicles going around circular curves, there is um, an inward radial force acting on the vehicle. So this is the road pushes on the tires um, and the tires push on the rest of the vehicle to keep the vehicle traveling around the curve. So we call this a centrifugal force or a centripetal acceleration or it's, it's moving towards the, the center basically. Um, that's the way the acceleration has to work. So um, we want to make sure that whatever road uh, system that we use, whatever roads we're building, um, if there's a curve, we also want that curve to push uh, the vehicle towards the center of the curve. So um, we use this, uh, this topic of super elevation. Um, that is to say we raise the road um, so that the, the side on the outside of the curve is higher the side on the inside of the curve is lower, uh, and that has the effect of adding the normal reaction, the normal force, um, to the, uh, the horizontal component, so that we've got friction plus the normal force is pushing the vehicle towards the center of the curve. If we had super elevation going the other way, if we had the, um, the inside of the curve was higher and the outside of the curve was lower, then the normal force would be pushing the vehicle away uh, from the curve and the friction would have to work harder in order to keep the vehicle on the road. So we use super elevation. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very common. Um, it's not everywhere. Um, we'll talk a bit about that briefly, but um, this is, in general, this is the purpose. This is what we want um, super elevation for. Um, question eight in your key questions, what is super elevation and what force does it compensate for? So super elevation is a change uh, in the road shape. Um, it's a raising of the road towards the outside of a curve and it compensates for the centrifugal force that needs to push a vehicle towards the center of a curve. Um, I'm not going to make you do the math. I don't think it's particularly um, I don't think this is a particularly mathy subject, and I'm sure you've done this in physics classes before, but this is basically what we're looking at um, in terms of having our overall radius, um, our acceleration uh, towards the center of a curve um, is, uh, is mass, um, uh, sorry, our acceleration is, is um, velocity squared on, on radius, um, radius of the curve. Uh, if we want to get a force out of that, we can apply the mass of the vehicle as well. Um, and again, you can generally look at saying the weight force is, is traveling down. We've got our, our um, normal force perpendicular to the surface that's pushing us around. Um, but uh, won't worry too much about the specifics, just if you need to visualize what's going on, I hope you're able to see the way that these friction forces need to work on the vehicle in order to keep it traveling around the curve. 
Um, so uh, if we are sitting, if the vehicle is sitting on the, the curve, if it's not moving um, up or down the incline, so it's basically, it's traveling around the curve, um, but it's sitting in a consistent um, height around the curve or a consistent, um, at a consistent radius around the curve, then we can solve for uh, what radius is is going to be um, best for us, um, given the angle of super elevation, given the friction that's reliable, um, and taking um, uh, you know our other functions of, of velocity and that sort of thing into account. So we can rearrange the the forces shown on the previous page if we were to sum all of the forces which are pushing um, on this vehicle and we were to try and rearrange the solve for radius, it's definitely um, doable. Again, you're not going to need to do this because in practice we don't do this calculation manually. We refer to the Australian standards which give us tables that state for different speeds, different design speeds, we have a, a minimum, a desirable um, and a tolerable range of radii that need to be used with different um, rates of super elevation. So what we can see, at least by looking at this, um, if we want to get the radius um, to be smaller, then we either need to um, have uh, super elevation uh, or friction to be increased because both of these items, super elevation E and friction F, are on the bottom line of this, um, of this uh, fraction. And so if we increase E or we increase F, then we can get a smaller radius. Um, we obviously want good friction anyway on all of our road surfaces, particularly we want good friction around curves, um, but uh, super elevation is one thing that we're able to control in the road geometry as well. Now, I talked before briefly about the, um, the case where the super elevation can go the other way. So sometimes the inside of the curve is higher than the outside. This happens all the time at roundabouts. Uh, roundabouts are quite often built with the inside annulus higher than the outside for drainage purposes. We don't want to have drains along the inside. In fact, you couldn't really put a drain on the inside because of this curb and then apron and sort of arrangement. It wouldn't really be functional. Um, it also, if you have a drain, even if you did find a way to make that functional and you built the drain on the inside or you built the drain down here um, between this, this concrete curb and, and this lip, this be creates a safety maintenance problem. How do you physically get uh, workers inside the radius, uh, inside the, the roundabout? You have to have circulating traffic going around them when you need to maintain that drain. So for a number of reasons, uh, roundabouts will quite often have what we call adverse super elevation or adverse crossfall. So this way the, ro the road is falling away. Um, it's, it's still doable, we can still navigate the road, um, but it's important to make sure that particularly for trucks, as trucks are made to approach the road, we have to make sure that we slow them down gradually um, so that by the time they reach the roundabout they're traveling slow enough and we've got a really, really large radius roundabout here um, so that the truck can still navigate the roundabout at a reasonable speed without fear of rolling over. Um, so yeah, there's lots of cases where this sort of adverse crossfall happens and to compensate because the the um, we've got adverse crossfall because we've got adverse super elevation. Um, we just need, the only thing we can really do is give us a much larger radius curve. And that works pretty well. So you've got another um, question, question nine, further to question eight, what is meant by adverse super elevation? I hope you're able to answer that question now. Okay, um, let's go on to some discussions of sight distance. So, um, Sight distance, typically, uh, this is what we would refer to as the length of road that a driver can see ahead at any particular point on the road. Um, we want to have enough sight distance so that we can uh, make decisions about what's coming up ahead, so that we can see entering and exiting vehicles, so that we can see um, intersections. These yellow and black um, signs, they're called CAMs. We want to make sure that we have enough sight distance going around a bend so that we can see at least two cams at any point. They help the driver to visualize the shape of the curve while they're going through it. So we space these, we put them at closer spacings if we have, say, more vegetation or if we have uh, problems with sight distance, um, and they can be at further spacings to give us a slight saving in cost um, if we have uh, a better visibility. So we need sight distance to make a lot of decisions about where we're driving. Um, we want to make sure that um, we've got time to stop 
um, if we need to, if we see there's an object, some object on the road, a stopped vehicle, um, a tree branch across the road, we need to see far enough ahead that we can uh, come to stop before that vehicle. We also need to see far enough ahead if we need to overtake a slow vehicle, uh, we need to see far enough ahead to um, judge the distance to oncoming vehicles um, and to uh, find a safe gap for overtaking as well. Enter the concept of SSID, the Safe Intersection Site Distance. Um, as much as it's talking about intersection site distance, we, we typically use this as a measure of minimum distance to stop. Um, so this obviously is a function of speed. Um, we need to know how fast we're traveling. Um, we've got uh, velocity. Um, so you see we've got two parts of this equation which are summed together. Um, both of these once we evaluate them, give us a distance in meters. Um, so in the first instance, we have DT. So this is our decision time. This is basically how long does it take for us to react, uh, observe, and decide, OK, yes, I'm going to break. So from the moment, if you're traveling at some velocity V, while you're thinking, the distance you travel is V times time. Velocity times time will give you um, a distance. So that's your thinking for two or three seconds. Um, then you decide to break. And after that, um, your, uh, your braking is a function of, um, of the amount of um, kinetic energy that your vehicle has. Um, it's an acceleration problem to reduce your, your velocity. Um, so uh, we have um, velocity squared is, is sort of um, in the numerator of this expression because we need to, uh, we, we're going to cover more distance um, disproportionately if we are traveling at a faster speed to start with. Um, and the other factors that we've got in here, um, we look at our coefficient of deceleration. So this varies for different vehicles. It varies for heavy vehicles, um, for light vehicles and so on. Um, and we've also got this factor which uh, relates to the grade. So if you're going up a hill and you need to stop, um, then you're going to stop more quickly than if you're going down a hill because the hill is going to be pushing. It's like we were talking about before, the normal force. If you're going up a hill, the normal force is going to be pushing you back and slowing you down. If you're traveling down a hill, the normal force is providing you with a force of acceleration to speed you up. So. Um, Again, you don't really need to do the math on this because there are design tables for all of it. Um, but uh, but sometimes we need to think about um, the height of vehicles. Sorry, I'm getting a phone call. Just let me mute that. Um, we need to think about the height of vehicles or objects on the road um, as well. So um, if we need to know how far in advance we can see over some sort of vertical curve or some sort of crest, um, what are we seeing too? And typically we are seeing to um, uh, an eye height, an object height of 1.25 meters, which is a typical roof height for a vehicle. So here we've got um, the vehicle. This is potentially at an intersection. So this vehicle is waiting to come out of the intersection. Here we have vehicle uh, eye height at 1.1 meters. That uh, line of sight needs to go from 1.1 meters um, carrying across to 1.25 meters to this area. And this is actually quite easy to do. You see this curvature here. It's quite easy to draw a line like this um, if you've got a long section of the road, because you can, if you've got a scaled long section, you can scale 1.25 meters and draw a dot. You can scale 1.1 meters and draw a dot. You can run this line and check to see if it intersects with the road surface. And if it doesn't, you've got the SSID that you need. Um, so this is how we can geometrically work this out. We need to make some assumptions about how fast we can break and how long does it take us to um, decide to stop. Um, so deciding to stop, um, we've got some values from um, the Austroads Guide to Road Design, um, but it's important to also think about what the road environment is, is like because um, the, uh, the more alert your driver is, if you've got road conditions that tend towards making drivers alert, like in urban areas, they will react faster and DT will be smaller. If your drivers are more likely to be um, you know, slower in reaction times because they've been traveling on the road for a long time, because they haven't come to a town in a while, if they're in, an, in a, a rural area, we might have a, a larger DT value. Um, so question 10 uh, in your key questions, what does SSID stand for? What function does it have in intersection design? Hopefully you can uh, answer those questions now. Here are some examples of DT, the driver reaction time. Um, so 
2.5 seconds is taken for unalerted driving conditions. Um, so this is when the driver is, um, uh, yeah, just basically traveling in a in an, um, a high speed rural freeway or high speed rural intersection. If they are, they don't have much to wake them up. Um, and we've got an intermediate condition in high speed urban, and then we've got a much smaller smaller reaction time if the driver is expected to be alert. So if there's a high expectancy of stopping because of traffic signals, if you're traveling up the main street in Ballarat, and you've got signals, 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 signals all the way up Sturt Street, or signals, signals, signals through Melbourne, you're going to be much more alert, much more um, prepared to stop in shorter notice. We have here some coefficients of deceleration as well. Um, so uh, we've got a good coefficient of deceleration if we are on a dry, sealed road. Um, we've got uh, you know, different decelerations for cars. Um, if we are on unsealed roads, if we are on wet roads, um, if we are on comfortably decelerating. So we basically, this is saying I've got a brake, but it's no real rush. I just apply the brakes gently, a different value here. Um, trucks and buses. Particularly, buses are very low because of the passenger comfort. Like this is, um, you know, their their ability to brake really quickly um, is limited by the uh, the potential for everyone in the bus to to go sliding along their seats. Um, overtaking sight distance. So we sort of touched on this before as well. This is how far ahead do we need to be able to see on a two lane two way highway so that we can judge a safe um, a pass of a slow vehicle to be safe and then to make that um, that passing movement as well. We want to make sure that we can do it without colliding with an opposing vehicle, without cutting off a past vehicle, of course. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else thinks about this, um, but I know personally if I, um, you know, I, I will drive to the speed limit or I'll drive under the speed limit if I'm on a road that, um, that I don't feel super comfortable traveling at 100. Might be signed at 100, but it's hilly and um, there's lots of drop-offs and stuff, so maybe I'm driving at 90 or 95. I know there's going to be lots of people that want to overtake me. Whenever there's an opportunity for overtaking, especially if I see the person's indicating like they're going to, I'll, I'll wait until they start to overtake and then I'll slow down even further so that they can overtake faster, um, they can get back to the safe lane, um, and there's less chance of, uh, of an overall collision. This picture probably is in India, yes. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, I would imagine so. That little... That little vehicle has a sort of an Indian vibe to it. Um, if we want to calculate the uh, the length of um, an overtaking lane distance or the, the overtaking sight distance, we need to make some assumptions. Um, so we can assume that the vehicle that we are passing is traveling at a uniform speed. Um, and as Douglas has said, most people speed up when getting overtaken. Yeah, I think there's something psychologically. People see someone going faster and they all of a sudden realize, oh, was I going slow? Oh, I guess I could be going faster. And so they, they go faster, um, which of course has a, a real problems for the person overtaking them in that it prolongs the amount of time that they're in the risky condition. Um, yeah, Hayden said it, it wakes them up. Yeah, so um, you get woken up if you get overtaken um, and uh, put your foot down a bit more. It's exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. Um, you want to minimize the amount of time that the other driver has to spend in a risky lane. Um, and the easiest thing to do is, even if you just take your foot off the accelerator, if you see someone overtaking, you just take your foot off the accelerator. Um, it makes it uh, that, that much safer for them to get back into the right lane um, and reduces the uh, the likelihood of any sort of anything going wrong. Um, so um, we assume that the speed of the passing vehicle is lower uh, when it is behind the slower vehicle, so that once they enter the passing section, they can speed up. Um, we, we enter a passing section, so a part of the road where we can, in theory, overtake, and the driver, after entering that period, has to decide if they're going to undertake the, the passing maneuver. Um, and then they can accelerate at about 10 k's an hour more than the slower vehicle. These are all of our assumptions. Um, which uh, which then lets us work out basically how long that length needs to be. We also want a certain amount of clearance before the slower vehicle and after the slower vehicle um, when we uh, are following and then we, when we get in front of that vehicle as well. Um, we've got uh, four different distances that we can identify. So we've got a distance um, that we would travel when we first think about entering that other vehicle or entering that other uh, passing stream. We've got a distance traveled while we are um, passing in the right lane. We've got a distance traveled 
between the passing vehicle and the opposing vehicle. So this is the distance. Um, uh, once we get to the end of the passing maneuver, we still want to finish a certain distance in front. And then we've got the distance moved by the opposing vehicle, um, uh, which is, um, sorry, distance moved by the opposing vehicle during two thirds of the time that the passing vehicle is in the left lane. So we want to, um, uh, we want to make sure that that um, vehicle coming the other way, we, we're not just, just getting in front of that, that vehicle coming the other way, we want to make sure we've got a bit of slack. So we take it as two thirds of, um, of the, uh, the other um, traveling distance. So we've got, um, uh, this is diagrammed here. Um, again, if we make all of our assumptions and we want to calculate these lengths, um, we, can, we can calculate what, uh, what overtaking lanes um, available availability needs to be. Um, in practice, if we're actually providing space for an overtaking, um, we tend not to say upgrade a road just so that we have enough space to make this kind of overtake. We will line mark based on um, whether it's safe and visible for a decent distance um, in general. Um, if we come in to upgrade a road to provide uh, for overtaking, it would be by providing a fully constructed overtaking duplicated width. So um, that, uh, that tends to be more often what's done. Okay, let's talk a bit, about more, a bit more about sight distance, this time sight distance at intersections. Um, so um, as we're approaching an intersection, um, anywhere where there's an intersection, there's that ability for vehicles to occupy the same space at the same time, and that's what we would call a crash. Um, so we can lower that high crash potential um, by giving us good sight distances. If the drivers can see what's going on uh, in advance of their movements, then they're able to um, make better decisions about um, what they need to do. Um, they can slow down if they need to slow down. They can do so without feeling like they are um, they're missing out on anything, and they can get into um, into the sort of right mindset. So um, we talk this concept about sight triangles, which we'll see shortly, which basically we measure up and along um, the different carriageways in which we're traveling and then back across. And we want to make sure that everything in the triangle as defined by different criteria on the major and intersecting road, um, everything inside that space is below driver's eye height. So we can have objects in there. Um, we can have curb and we can have um, signs that that are um, narrow um, parking signs and that sort of thing. We can have um, you know the the stalks of of thin trees, but we can't have shrubs and bushes and other big objects. We can't have houses and brickwork and bus stops. All the things that are really uh, taking up a lot of uh, visible um, space. Um, if we've got a signalized intersection, then we basically just need the driver to be able to see um, from the stop line um, to check when they're, they're able to cross. So here, this is Sturt Street in Ballarat. If you come up to the stop line and you want to cross, obviously you're waiting for the signals to let you go, but ideally you're also making a head check to see that oncoming vehicles aren't going to collide with you and that they've obeyed the speed, uh, the traffic signals as well. Um, so we don't need, you can see we've got buildings right on the corners here because we don't need good visibility um, as much at signalized intersections. We, we depend on the traffic signals to do the job of defining the traffic movements for us. But for unsignalized intersections, we need to make sure that we have enough view of the crossing or intersecting road so that we can and, um, assess the crossing vehicle's position um, and that we can um, get the right sort of uh, input to then make that decision as well. So we have um, uh, two types of sight triangles. We've got approach sight triangles, which as you might imagine, this gives us a visibility of what's happening on the road as we approach the intersection. We've also got departure sight triangles. So this is saying we've pulled up and we've stopped and then we are getting ready to depart and we want to be able to see just from our departure position. Question 11 and 12 are, um, and 13 are either on this slide, the previous slide, or about to come up. So they're all related to um, view obstruction on approaches, approach site triangles, and so on. So the approach site triangle, um, this is for drivers on both the major road and the minor road to see each other. We want to see approaching intersecting vehicles and we want to do so with enough time so that we can um, apply the brakes if we need to come to a stop or slow down 
um, to avoid that collision. So this is shown as an uncontrolled intersection, but in theory, if everything was um, uh, fully visible, we could see cars coming, we could decide if we wanted to cross, turn in, uh, we could do this with a, um, a, a good distance. We have a certain point on the minor road um, for an uncontrolled intersection or um, uh, where there's some sort of give way signage or something. Um, a decision point is a location where the driver should start braking or decelerating. We should basically um, either know that we don't need to do anything to change our speed because there's nothing coming, or we know we need to start braking now um, because there is something coming and we're not going to see. And that's the sort of, um, this decision point, this defines where the sight triangles are drawn. So if I go to the next slide, here we've got a approach sight triangle. So we are approaching um, the major road and um, we have our decision point um, at which this, this distance here between the decision point and the, uh, the major road, that's how long it's gonna take us to stop. Um, and if we've got a clear sight triangle here that goes from the decision point back to the similar um, decision point for a vehicle, or not even decision point exactly, but the, um, the distance back that shows a, a vehicle traveling at the design speed along this road that will reach and collide um, with the crossing vehicle if they happen to cross at the same time. We need to be able to see all the way back there so that we can make our movement across. If we have this area clear, if we have all of this space is provided and there's good visibility, then we are able to use a give way sign. So if we check the approach site triangle and we find that the approach site triangle is clear, it's appropriate to use a give way signage. Um, if we uh, don't have the approach site triangle clear, we at least need the departure site triangle to be clear. So the departure site triangle, this lets a stopped vehicle on the minor road see what's coming far enough to then cross the road. Um, so we need at least to have that departure site triangle. Um, and if, we, if all we've got is the departure site triangle, then we can use a stop sign to control the traffic there. Okay, let's talk about channelization. Um, let me know in the comments if you recognize uh, this intersection. Um, it's probably one that anyone who's attended the, um, the Mount Helen campus will have used, um, but uh, possibly harder to recognize from satellite. Um, so channelization, as we mentioned before, this is useful to separate conflicting traffic movements. We physically force um, the traffic movements into um, some kind of definite path, either with a concrete median um, or uh, potentially here we have just a painted median but they still assist in um, in pushing vehicles away from the, um, the median space and and uh, providing some separation between vehicles making opposing movements um, so they can be really helpful to channelize movements at uh, at great intersections um, because we can we give us much more uh, control over where um, vehicles are moving. Lachlan has asked, is this intersection near Damascus? And yes, it is. This is, um, this is the college or the, the, uh, the school up on the top here. And um, this is the, I think, primary school down here. And this is Geelong Road. So yeah, this is um, uh, where we've, uh, you've probably driven that road many times going to, to um, Mount Helen campus. Um, so we're able to, yeah, really use the channelization to have greater control over vehicle movements. Um, so a couple of different things we can call here. We've got a traffic island, uh, which is some area between traffic lanes. So there's a traffic island here, there's a traffic island here, uh, there's a traffic island... Actually, that's all I can see in, in this one. Um, so just a couple in, in this one. Um, but uh, they, they help to regulate the movement of vehicles. They also give pedestrians a place to stop. There's no pedestrian refuge in here, um, but in many other intersections, we use a large pedestrian island to give pedestrians a place to wait um, while making a multiple cross of a road. Because of the width of this road here, and because there's no real points of walking attraction um, further along Geelong Road on this side, um, we wouldn't want pedestrians to cross this large width and then um, cross again here. You can see the way the paths have been shaped. We're encouraging the pedestrians actually to walk all the way along um, the footpath around here, or away from the high-speed road um, completely, so that they're at minimum risk.
So traffic islands can be painted. We've got a painted island in here. Um, you can imagine a physical island in there would be a hazard in itself. It would also be um, potentially blocking uh, some vehicle movements. Um, but we can also have a physical barrier. So here we've got a concrete um, island and, uh, and they, they have certain advantages as well. They're helpful to shelter um, infrastructure. So we don't want people colliding with our traffic signals. It costs us a fortune. Uh, every time someone, um, some truck or, or other vehicle clips the traffic signals. So we put nice wide traffic islands around all of the signals um, so that they are collided with less frequently and also to, um, to give us a nice uh, wide area to separate vehicles traveling in, in different uh, movements. If we channelize intersections properly, we get an increased capacity and movements, we get uh, better safety and we increase the confidence of drivers using the intersection. Um, so uh, we've got a couple of questions um, here. Question 14, what is meant by channelization of at-grade intersections? And question 15, how are traffic islands typically constructed? Hopefully you can answer those now. Um, so there's a few things that influence the design of channelized intersections. Um, for a start, we need um, the amount of space. So when we say availability of right of way, this is talking about the actual road reserve. It's the area that we can build in. If we don't have the area, we, we can't channelize. Um, we're talking about terrain as well. There's some places where it's too steep or where there's a drop off or something. That means that we also can't channelize. The design vehicle, whether it's a passenger vehicle, a uh, heavy vehicle like a bus or a truck, um, we need to know about our pedestrian and vehicular volumes, um, the demand for particular turns, how many people want to turn left, how many pedestrians want to cross, all of these things factor into our, our design approaches. Um, we uh, we will look at the, the roads that cross and what their cross sections are like. Um, we need to check about uh, approach speed as well. We need to make sure that um, uh, vehicles that are going to be channelized into a left, um, that they've got appropriate space to decelerate before their channelization. That way the angle of the traffic island, the angle that the traffic island makes here, is also appropriate for their movements. If we have too steep of an angle um, and the vehicles don't have enough time to slow down, we're going to create a, a problem area for accidents. Um, so all of these things um, need to be considered. We also need to know um, what location and type of traffic control device. As I mentioned before, the traffic signals um, get located within the islands and um, part of the island location will be defined based on where the traffic signals need to be because there are restrictions on exactly how far from the center of a lane the traffic signals need to be and how high they need to be. Um, so all of that might have, might have factored into exactly where this island gets built. So there's a number of things that we can do with channelization. We can make sure that vehicles are directed. We don't want any more than two paths to, to cross. Um, it, uh, it helps us reduce the overall number of conflict points by limiting the amount of uh, possible movements that can occur simultaneously. We want to control merging, diverging and crossing um, and make sure that the angle of, of crossing is controlled for different vehicles. Um, if you picture a very wide lane or just a wide area of asphalt, maybe if it's just painted, um, excuse me, <coughs> pardon me. Um, you can picture um, a vehicle that doesn't really know where it needs to stay and doesn't really have any, um, any strong uh, encouragement to stay in a particular area. And we would refer to this as wander. The vehicle would sort of, um, it could float uh, anywhere between the, the hard left, the hard right, or anywhere in between a, a lane. Um, Many times the crossing point, if I go back a slide, um, this width in here might be as much as five meters and the typical uh, passenger vehicle would be two meters wide or less. So there's lots of, of space in here. Now, if this traffic island wasn't here and you had all the space uh, in the world to get around, you can imagine vehicles traveling slower than maybe the vehicle behind wants to be traveling and someone tries to overtake in this area and um, people aren't really sure, are you staying in the lane to turn left, are you moving out? Um, so decreasing that, that vehicle wander is also um, really helpful. Um, it reduces the amount of paved area that we need to build, which is good. Um, it also uh, makes it very clear where you need to be, what, what lane you need to start in, what lane you're going to finish in, depending on where you want to go. 
um, and it also helps us give priority to different movements. So the slip lanes, um, they don't conflict with anything else. You're able to wait, give way and cross even if it's a green light for the crossing traffic. Um, we're able to um, you know, give a clear priority to, to that movement. If at other intersections like here, uh, we have a separation between the right and the left hand movements. Um, again, it's, it's clear when people are queuing up in different areas exactly where they're going to go. Some other things that we will do with, with traffic islands or with channelization, uh, we'll provide a space for pedestrians, pedestrian refuge. As we discussed before, the refuge needs to be, I think, at least 2.5 metres long, uh, and that's to accommodate a person pushing a pram. Uh, we want uh, separate storage lanes for turning vehicles. If we don't have separate storage lanes, if you've just got one lane that stores vehicles wanting to turn left, wanting to turn right, wanting to go straight, um, as you do at the end of Fussell Street, if I go up to... Um, to here. For anyone who's used this intersection, Ballarat Byron Beat Road, Victoria Street, it's a major arterial. There's um, the rail crossing uh, under the, the bridge just there. Um, this intersection here on Fussell Street, um, it only has. Um, actually, I think they might have changed it. Is this up to date? Google Street View. No, I, don't, I think they must, must have changed this one. Let me check Near Map. Because um, this intersection, you have to wait um, for, you've only got one signal, one sort of green uh, signal will release left, right, and straight vehicles. Um, well, let's go back there, there's Wendery, there's Fussell Street down here. Ah, that's right. So we've got a right turn lane um, for vehicles that want to turn right, but the uh, the left lane, this is for left and through vehicles. So um, you can get a green signal here for vehicles that want to turn left, but not for vehicles that want to go straight. But because there's only one lane for both vehicles, if the vehicle in front wants to go straight and they get a left clear signal, all the vehicles behind them can't go anywhere. Um, it's, uh, it's frustrating, but, um, but it happens um, quite a lot. Um, and also there's a very short signal phase here because Ballarat Byron Beat Road is a very high priority road, so it gets most of the green time. We have a very short green time for, for the movements out of the other roads. Um, and, uh, and by having the only one lane there, it really does restrict the, the function of the road. So ideally we will have separate storage lanes for turning vehicles, um, which maximizes the efficiency of the intersection, um, but at the cost of needing to construct more lanes. It gives us space to put our traffic control devices. We talked about that before. We can control prohibited turns. So with traffic islands, we can physically block someone making an illegal U-turn by the way that we shape the intersection. Um, and, uh, and if it's very clear that it's not going to physically work, people are less likely to try and do the illegal thing. And it's usually illegal for safety reasons. So Try to make it clear, uh, and then we get a better outcome that way as well. Um, if we have uh, different traffic movements at um, signalised intersections, we're able to separate them out so that, again, people are able to use left turn slip lanes, they're able to wait in their right turn lanes and that sort of thing. Um, and the traffic islands also, by visually narrowing the road, they help to restrict the speed of vehicles traveling through. They provide certain angles and certain geometry that the driver must physically comply with, and all of these things help to restrict um, the speed of vehicles. A couple other things we've got to quickly talk about. We want to make sure that uh, a driver is not being asked to make more than one decision at a time. Um, so we want to make sure that they are um, they're very clear on what lane they need to be in and where they need to brake for, and that they're not both deciding if they need to brake, if they need to change lanes, um, and if they need to, um, I don't know, uh, turn harder um, at the same time. Um, we want to avoid sharp reverse curves. So a reverse curve is um, where we go straight from one curve, say we're, we're curving um, clockwise, and then we start curving anti-clockwise straight away. This is a reverse curve where we've changed um, curvature. We want to avoid that in a sharp um, setting because it's quite difficult for a driver to navigate easily, especially if you don't have power steering. Um, and any uh, turning paths which are greater than 90 degrees should also be avoided. 
Um, so shallower than 90 degrees is fine, uh, more than 90 degrees starts to become a bit of a problem. We want areas for merging and weaving to be as long as possible. So um, the merge lengths, we have minimums for these, but we, we also have desirables. And if, if we've got more space, we want to give more, people much more space to merge in. Um, something that's, that's often done, and we can see a good example of it um, if I go to the uh, Ballarat Central Livestock Exchange, which is what's that Western Highway, uh, just up here. So this is the Ballarat Central Livestock Exchange, or Central Victorian Livestock Exchange, CVLX massive building um, there's a turning lane here and a through lane um, and then for exiting vehicles there's a through lane um, and a lane for the vehicles that have just joined so we've got this merge the merge begins and it carries on through all of this area here but and it's not too visible on the satellite because of the way that the asphalt is much darker but you can actually see from the point where this merge starts to the point where the merge ends, there is an additional three meters of sealed shoulder so that if anyone happens to um, misjudge their merge and they need more space, they're not going to lose control of their vehicle out here. They're actually going to be able to stay on the sealed shoulder and decelerate or accelerate or something and get back into the same traffic stream as the other vehicles. So that um, was a lot of extra expense for the developer to build that, but it's a much better safety outcome uh, because of the uh, the sort of better treatment of those uh, um, of, of that decision point, that merging um, action has is much more forgiving. See if I can get these other few slides done quite quickly. I might speed up a bit. Um, so uh, let's see what else have we got. Merging, weaving as long as possible. Crossing traffic streams. We want tra crossing traffic streams to intersect at 90 degrees, as we've talked about before. Um, we obviously also want good sight distance when we're considering our, our channelization. Um, when we've got our, um, our turning vehicles, we need to make sure, so we've tried to show it here, we need to make sure that the vehicles that are queuing or the vehicles that are turning um, don't interfere with through vehicles. So you can imagine we've got a queue here and we want to make sure that this queue is clearing often enough that vehicles don't queue further back, blocking the movement here. Um, I didn't find another good example, but there's lots of cases where um, poorly designed um, crossing points, if you have a crossing point somewhere in the middle of a, a queuing lane, you can have a problem where the vehicles queue over and block the lane. And yes, you might put down some keep clear marking, but that's not always uh, appropriate. It doesn't always work. Um, so it's, uh, it's important to try to design those problems out of the intersection, potentially by not even allowing this movement. If you have, a, if you have options to turn um, left only and do a U-turn, that might be better than trying to allow a right turn out if this is a routinely long queue. Any prohibited turns, obviously we should physically block prohibited turns so that we don't just depend on signage. People will disobey signage uh, as easy as breathing. Um, and uh, we also need to think about, as we said before, where we're going to put our traffic control devices. All right, so have a chat about signalized intersections, and then we'll have our half hour break for lunch. Um, so traffic signals, we typically use these where uh, other less expensive forms of treatment are found to not be good enough. Uh, they're not going to operate um, satisfactorily because they either um, don't have enough capacity, uh, they don't allow for the mixed um, demand on different legs, or they have a high accident crash rate. Now, we typically wouldn't install traffic signals um, unless there was a good warrant for them because traffic signals are expensive. They have a high cost initially and then they have a continuing maintenance cost. They need uh, ongoing maintenance, especially if they are clipped or hit by traveling vehicles. Um, there's, they're quite costly. Um, a few guidelines, these are sort of general rules of thumb for new traffic signals. So we want the traffic volume on the major road to be at least 600 vehicles per hour and the minor road to at the same time to have the same peak which carries at least 200 vehicles per hour. Um, and this needs to be on average any four hour period of the day. Uh, we also want continuous traffic. So uh, we want traffic on the main road to be sufficient that it would cause us um, a delay or a hazard for traffic on the minor road. 
So you can imagine without signals here, if we've got no gaps because the traffic is continuous, but we also have a high demand for vehicles exiting, and there's only space for left or right at the same time, so vehicles wanting to do a quick left have to wait for vehicles wanting to do a right. Um, this is an area where driver frustration will increase, um, risk taking happens after frustration increases, um, and the risk taking leads to accidents. Also, traffic signals are very useful where we have um, a high pedestrian volume and high crash volume as well. Signal phasing, we've got um, signal phasing questions um, in your um, uh, coming up in your question 16, your key lesson criteria. I think it's the next slide or so. We're talking about um, split phasing, but signal phasing in general to start the introduction to this. Um, a phase is just a state of the signals. So it's basically saying one direction has the green light. One um, stream of traffic has the right of way. Um, this gives us one signal phase. So we have at least one movement gaining right of way at the start, one movement losing right of way at the end. Um, here we've got uh, four phases identified. So east-west goes, then we have left turns concurrently, north-south goes, then we have, um, uh, sorry, is that right turn? No, that's, yeah, that's left. Um, and then we've got opposing left. I'm quite confused by that. I think I'm misreading something, but I won't go into it too much. Um, we can also have a cyclical phase system. So this is um, just, uh, this might be the dumbest kind of, and I say dumb in the sense of it's, it is the least um, intelligence or the least input behind it, um, where it just cycles um, one, two, three, four uh, in a pattern um, infinitely. If we have a flexible phasing sequence, then we have the ability to add some sort of input to change what's going on. So maybe we don't detect any vehicles um, that are waiting to, to make our movements um, uh, out of these other uh, areas. So we can just go straight back and forth between um, the, uh, the east-west and the north-south. And maybe after we detect a vehicle, we go back here, and then we go back to this one. We can, we can arrange it in a flexible setting. Um, so we've got a couple of methods for putting in our phasing arrangements. Um, we can have a phase control. So this is um, specifying how much time um, between the green phases, how much yellow time do we have, um, how much minimum time do we have for all phases. Or we can control um, the groups of movements. So we group all of the different um, uh, sort of uh, movements of, of throughs, straights, and lefts, um, and then we we set all the parameters for those groups. Your question 16 is now visible on the page. What is split phasing? You can sort of see it here. I'll talk about it quickly. So a couple of different arrangements. We've got two phase, which is um, just sort of north, south, and then east, west. Three phase, which has a special phase for um, right turn through. We block the opposing movement to the right turn, and the slip left, learn, uh, left turn can occur at the same time. Um, split phasing is, um, is where we have uh, phases that are opposed that cannot occur at the same time. So we've got um, through and right, through and right, pedestrian, pedestrian, um, and then we have crossing the other way as well. Um, I'm not going to go through and read all of this. Um, I'm just going to quickly skim over it. So um, we need the choice of our, um, our phasing system to depend on the layout, so how many lanes and how many turns do we have, um, what's the horizontal and vertical alignment like, what are the traffic flows? What's the demand? How much heavy vehicle fraction do we have? Do we have um, a coordinated signal system or do we have a, um, a standalone signals, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute? Um, are there pedestrians? Do the pedestrian movements um, you know, trigger um, changes in the signals? Um, and are there any special vehicles? So there's some uh, signalized intersections in Ballarat um, where there is a, an intersection that is always off unless uh, firefighters need to exit the firefighting building in a hurry, and then it blocks movements just for the firefighters to come out. So there's some emergency special movements as well. Coordinated traffic signals, I briefly, briefly spoke about these in the last slide. So traffic signals can be made to talk to each other. There's a communication system. It uses the Telstra network. Um, it can also use a, a wireless network as well, so that the signals can talk to each other to coordinate. So in the peak flow, if the peak flow is traveling in the direction of the green arrows, we can make sure that you 
routinely get lining up of all the green lights so that we get the maximum throughput um, in the peak period. We typically can only optimize this in one direction though. So you can see vehicles traveling in the blue direction, they will eventually hit reds because they are not being optimized, but at the same time they are traveling counter peak. So we don't need as much volume there. Question 17, what is traffic signal coordination and can it benefit all directions of travel? That's visible on this, uh, this slide. Um, traffic signal coordination gives us a number of benefits. We get less travel time, we get less delay, less greenhouse gases, less noise. Um, it's a sort of a better, better, better arrangement. Um, upgrades to Mare Street that are being put in place presently in Ballarat, those Mare Street upgrades um, are going to use coordinated traffic signals as well so that they will have the peak directions will be uh, optimized um, for travel. Our signal timing needs to consider safety, capacity, Am I going to, yeah, I've only got a few slides. We'll press on and then we'll take our, our half hour lunch break. Um, our signal timings, we need enough time to make good decisions. Uh, we need enough time to make, um, uh, to have enough vehicle movements. Because we have uh, a bit of time lost at the start and a bit of time lost at the end of each green cycle, the longer the green cycles are, the more capacity we get. So the more efficiency uh, we get out of the movements. But the longer the cycles are, the more average delay we get and so the more drivers become frustrated. So there seems to be a need to strike a balance. Um, we have to try to look at how we can um, how we can get the best outcomes and typically that best outcome occurs when we can measure what the demand is like in real time. So there's lots of intersections that let us do that. Um, we want to make sure that we've got um, a good level of service and uh, a balanced level of service in all of our movements. So we don't just want uh, you know, a level of A for the minor road and an F level for the, sorry, a level of A for the major road and an F level of service for the minor road. Um, we don't just want pedestrians to have the gold standard and vehicles to get nothing or vice versa. We want to try and, and level out everything. This gives us quite often the best economic outcomes as well if everyone's being given some sort of um, treatment. Uh, we might consider priority for public transport or for heavy vehicles as well. Um, we might need to give some additional green time because of heavy vehicles. So heavy vehicles take longer to accelerate from a stop. They take um, uh, they they are physically longer, so they uh, they take longer to clear an intersection just in general, um, and uh, they can make a real big impact to the efficiency of even one green cycle. If you've got a uh, you know a B double ahead of you loaded up with cows or sheep or something, um, that can really um, accelerate quite slowly away. And where you'd normally clear 15 to 20 passenger vehicles, maybe now you're only clearing the B double, the one car that was in front of it, and one car behind it. Um, particularly if we have an uphill grade for the intersection, um, that's going to make a big difference. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we we may need a a larger um, uh, a larger green space we talked about before. We also want to make sorry, getting a phone call. Let me just turn that. I should put that on mute. Shall we? In a sec. Um, so uh, we also know that we have a. Um, you know, a maximum tolerable delay on human patience. We humans are not going to want to sit and wait for too long. Um, so we, that's why we, even though we get the most efficiency out of longer cycles, we'll tend to um, shorten the cycles just so that people feel like they're moving. Um, there are lots of fixed time signals where we would just calculate an optimum uh, cycle time and then that would just run forever. It would just be this the same cycle that would just repeat. Um, but we typically now we have modern signals that use actuated controls. Um, so actuated meaning that there's some sort of uh, input. Um, typically this actuation comes from a, um, a, a detector loop, a magnetic detector loop, which is under the asphalt and it physically detects a, a car approaching. Um, but also we now have cameras that can be used to uh, provide an input. They detect a vehicle waiting in a particular lane and they do the same thing. They just provide a signal that says there's a vehicle waiting. That's all That's all they do. They're very basic. It's, a, it's an in, out, on, off, um, one and zero type of, um, what am I trying to say? It's a binary condition. Um, binary condition, true, false, whether it's a, 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 an actuator in the ground or, or a camera, they do the same thing. Um, SCATS uh, is, is the, the system that um, uh, the different signals talk to each other over. Um, and um, so we can have, a, a, again, another input that tells the, um, the signal controller exactly what it should be doing. 
um, and um, it can can be then sort of used in the sort of main control center to calculate on a cycle by cycle basis what is the best amount of green time because of the presence of queued vehicles. Um, we need appropriate time for pedestrians as well. Um, I've got a question for you in your, um, uh, your key, lecture criteria, key lecture questions. What is the Australian standard walking speed for a pedestrian crossing a road? It's 1.2 meters per second is the answer there. Um, we need enough walk time for pedestrians to cross the road. They need to um, be able to press the button, um, hear the, the beeps and, and cross. Then once the, the green time stops, they also need more time to clear the intersection. So they might hurry a little bit faster. Uh, they might travel at 1.5 meters a second once they get to the red, but they need to be able to have just stepped onto the pavement when it turns red, and they still need to be able to clear the whole thing. Sometimes we actually um, control the phasing on an intersection um, by limits of pedestrians. So we have designed everything for um, vehicles and we know it only takes eight seconds for all the queued vehicles in the left turn lane to uh, make their movement. But because it takes 15 seconds for the pedestrians to cross, that becomes the controlling movement. Okay, so we've got our next lecture today on um, traffic control, a bit shorter than some of the others. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, get stuck straight in. Uh, once again, there's key lecture questions. Make sure you, uh, you follow along with those. And um, let me know in the comments if you've got any questions. Okay, so we'll talk a bit about conflict points. We've mentioned these before, but we'll have a look at some other diagrams, and some other ways of thinking about them or eliminating them. We'll talk a bit about SIDRA, um, what that is and, and, um, and what you can do with it. We'll talk about signal timing. We've got a bit of material that we're um, we sort of we've touched on before, but it'll make a bit more sense to repeat in this instance. So, as I said, you might see some topics come up, and you think, "Oh, we've we've seen this, or we've seen these keywords." We're just going to go into them in a little bit more detail um, and and help you to uh, to remember them. So, conflict points. Um, why why do we uh, have traffic control? Um, what, uh, what is our purpose? So we need to assign the right of way. Uh, we need to tell drivers who, um, who has the right to make their different movements. Um, and this, um, in essence, creates the, the structure, the order um, by which all other traffic functions can then occur. Um, if we've got rules that are orderly and predictable, um, I think predictability is probably the, the key thing there then um, the incidence of, of crashes is going to be greatly reduced um, and everything is going to function pretty well. It's interesting to note, however, that um, you know, we have, as humans, we have a lot of road rules. Like there's literally road rules measured in the hundreds um, of you know, when, which lines you can cross and who has to give way to whom and what the speed limits are and when you can overtake and all this kind of thing. Um, and all of those rules are necessary for us to move around, but they also create confusion because if you're a new driver or you're you know, in a new circumstance and you're trying to remember all the different rules, it's a lot to process. I think I re recall a statistic where scientists had studied the flight of, uh, of ducks. I don't know if it was ducks in general or birds in general or specifically ducks, but studied the flight and noticed that they, they uh, navigate or they manage to avoid collisions with other airborne birds by following only two rules. Maintain the same basic speed as the duck in front of you, maintain the same um, you know, uh, relative distance from the duck in front of you. That's all they do and they manage to avoid collisions. Um, but I guess it might be a little bit easier if you're moving in three dimensions instead of moving in two dimensions as we tend to be on the road. <clears throat> anyway, um, that's, uh, that's a bit of an aside. But um, so making sure that we have some kind of um, uh, of predictable movement is is the main thing. Um, so if we want that um, that to be our sort of our starting point, what our our traffic control needs to be doing, um, then to be effective, we want to make sure that um, the traffic control device is commanding attention, uh, that it's serving some purpose. We don't we don't want um, you know signage that uh, that's superfluous or that isn't really needed to convey all the necessary information. We want the meaning to be clear and simple. Again, we don't want people to be having to decide multiple um, key pieces of information. They should really only be making one decision at a time. Um, and uh, they want we want to um, our traffic control devices to command the respect of road users. So to break that statement down a little bit. 
if we were to um, say put a 60 km an hour speed sign on the Western Highway when there's uh, no intersections, there's good curvature, there's good road width, there's all that sort of thing, people will lose respect for the sign. Um, if we have a stop sign where a give way sign is appropriate, people lose respect for the sign. So it's appropriate that we, or it's important that we keep using the right control devices in the right locations so that they, when people see them, they still command respect. We also need to make sure the visibility and the positioning of these instruments is, um, is considerate of the amount of time it takes for drivers to respond. Because after all, we're in moving vehicles. While you're thinking, you're still uh, covering distance. Um, so we need to make sure that we have the appropriate space, the appropriate positioning on the road um, for, for all of that to work. Question one in your key lecture questions, what is the purpose of traffic control? You can sort of see that there. Um, conflict points. Uh, your question two, what is a conflict point? We can see this here. So conflicts occur when traffic streams moving in different directions interfere. That's the sort of simple definition. It's, um, uh, you know, traffic streams that are crossing, traffic streams that are weaving. Um, there's some demand for multiple vehicles or a vehicle and a pedestrian or a pedestrian and a cyclist, something like that, for multiple um, modes to occupy the same space at the same time. That's a potential conflict. So we talked before about um, uh, you know, grade separated intersections and at grade intersections. In a grade separated intersection, we can remove the conflict by separating the space. At an at grade intersection, we need to separate the vehicles in time. It's the only way to avoid the conflict becoming a real um, collision. So three main types of conflicts that we've got, merging, diverging, and crossing. Merging is coming together, diverging is moving apart, and crossing is um, uh, you know, streams that are moving relative to each other at 90 degrees or, or thereabouts at some angle. Um, so if we're looking at how bad a conflict is, we need to think about um, what type of conflict it is, um, you know, what's the, the probability of that crash, so how many vehicles are going to um, be likely to make each movement and to have that potential for conflict. Um, and uh, we need to think about the speed of the vehicles as well, because that's a big factor in terms of the significance of the conflict. Um, we note that last point, crossing conflicts have the most severe effect on traffic flow, um, which is true both in that there is the largest delay and the largest potential for, uh, for risk in terms of a crash. Uh, this is a diagram that you may have seen before. It's, it's pretty common or pretty famous in, in uh, uh, discussions about conflicts. This is showing for a, um, a four-leg uh, intersection or a cross intersection. Um, it's showing all the different ways that um, uh, all the different points of conflict um, between movements. So we've got, um, uh, what is it, a total of 32 different points of conflict. Um, a similar roundabout would be down to eight, I think. So it's a really significant uh, change there. Um, but um, you can see here that we've got potential for um, a right turning vehicle to collide with a left, to collide with a through. Through vehicles on opposing streams can collide with each other. Um, these are all the crossing conflicts in the center. And outside of that, we have conflicts at a merge where two vehicles try to enter the same lane at the same time or we have conflicts at a diverge where one vehicle is leaving that part of the lane um, and diverges we have a great potential for rear end collisions because someone might think a vehicle is getting out of the way at a certain speed and that they're going to keep getting out of the way at that speed and then maybe they break or maybe they change their mind and so diverge also are points of conflict. Um, We've talked about stop signs before, so I'll, I'll go over this pretty quickly. We're not going to be here for too long, as I sort of alluded to before. We've got, um, we can go through these, these ones pretty quick. Um, so stop signs, um, we obviously need to stop at them. Um, we don't want to use them at signalized intersections. We also need to make sure that we use these um, where we have uh, a restricted view is one of the most important things. So limited visibility. Um, and uh, we especially uh, need to make sure that we are um, using these in an appropriate area for the sort of crash history. If, if we've got a stop sign um, and, uh, and it's there because of restrictive view, but we keep seeing crashes, we might need to consider a more expensive treatment to control that intersection. Um, 
if we've got um, you know high speed as well this also gives us pause to say a stop sign might be an appropriate treatment um, because the the speed means that we need to see on the major road a further distance back for safety and maybe we don't have that good visibility we talked about intersection channelization before so lots of definitions in this in this class as I discussed before so um, we use channelization to separate uh, turning lanes and through lanes. Uh, we use traffic signals to control traffic at an intersection quite effectively, but at, uh, as I've said many times before, the signals still depend on obedience. We still have to notice, recognize, interpret and obey the signals in order for them to function. And any breakdown in not noticing them, not interpreting them correctly, um, they will cause, uh, or they can cause accidents. Um, the first, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but my um, I think the first and only uh, traffic accident that I've been involved with, or at least that I've been responsible for when I uh, freshly had my uh, my P's, um, was I came up to an intersection that had a, um, a signalised intersection that had a, um, a right-hand turn that um, could be green or it could be give way. And I misinterpreted the lack of a red arrow to think that I had priority. Um, and luckily for me, the vehicle that I, um, I was, was hit by um, were, were able to see me and slow down. They were only a light vehicle um, and nobody was hurt. But um, yeah, it could have, been, could have been very bad for me if that had been a heavy vehicle or, or someone traveling at speed. Um, here are some common terms that you will hear quite frequently whenever you're talking about um, traffic signals. Um, so we've got uh, the cycle that we already spoke about um, it's on the bottom side of this page. I won't spend too much time talking about that, but I want to talk a bit about the controller um, and give you a bit of uh, sort of wider understanding of, of some of the things you might not have thought about in terms of the controller, especially in, in uh, today's age. So the controller, as the name suggests, um, it tells the signal lamps to change colors. It does the job of controlling the signal process. So every signalized intersection that you see, there's a little box similar to the one that we've seen on screen here that sits somewhere near the intersection and it handles all the programming basically. Um, a lot of cases they use not exactly old fashioned but um, big chunky uh, bits of hardware because they're less likely to um, to fail. So if you have small integrated circuits, um, you know, we're talking about a a piece of hardware that needs to <coughs> pardon me, sit on the side of the road um, outdoors for decades and function well. Um, so small uh, integrated circuits are, are more likely to um, you know, have shorts or, or other problems. Big chunky bits of hardware, they, they last quite a long time. They're very expensive, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, they are programmed by a very small number of people, um, in Victoria at least, a very small number of people in the uh, one of the Vic Roads head offices, and they take a very long time to order. So if you are ever um, working on behalf of um, local government, on behalf of state government, or behalf, on behalf of a um, private developer, and you need to um, produce a signal controller as part of some um, something that you're delivering or need to have a, a set of signals installed, one of the things that's going to be most critical for you in terms of your project delivery will be ordering the signal controller as early as you possibly can. So you can't order the signal controller without a designed intersection and you can't um, uh, order the signal controller without um, all the appropriate signal phasing and everything designed, but you've got to make sure you bring that stuff up as soon as you can so that you can send away and get the signal controller program designed and built um, because it can take uh, you know 20 or 30 weeks to uh, is the lead time to get one of these units. So it can be a really long time. Um, really important to note if you're, as I said, if you're ever in a time critical project, um, it's uh, they're very hard to get a hold of. And the one of the um, strange technologies, excuse me for a sec. <coughs> pardon me, one of the strange technologies, again, that you might not have thought about um, that uh, that is affected by the coronavirus in that certain parts that go in these things are manufactured in China. Um, and uh, the, due to restrictions or closing down of, of factories, um, even from months ago, there have been ongoing delays in the ability to um, get uh, signal controllers um, delivered to Australia and installed on some of our projects. We're just having a quick look here. Um, we've got phase A and phase B, um, and we're looking at uh, when different vehicles can go in each of these phases, if this is a traffic signal. So we've got a green section, this is the go interval, a yellow section, which is you know making giving people time to make a decision, and then red, which is not go. Um, we have uh, 
an all red interval. You'll notice that the green slices are you know, less than if you put the if you overlaid the two green slices on each other, um, you wouldn't actually have a um, it wouldn't be all green or just greens and yellows. You would have a period where there is um, uh, there is all red on all approaches. Um, I think we might have, is it mentioned on, yeah, okay, we've got the next couple of slides. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, phase, we talked about the definition of that before. That's a part of the cycle. It's where one stream gets to go. Um, an interval is a change. So it's a part of, it's a part of the cycle length where there is, um, oh, sorry, where, they do, where there's no change. So a part of the cycle length where the signal indicators stay the same. This is um, uh, one, one interval. And an offset is the, the change, uh, the offset time in seconds. Um, that gives us the difference in length between the green phase beginning at one intersection um, and the corresponding green phase beginning uh, at the next intersection. It's the base, um, the time base of the system controller, um, which gives us an idea about how. Uh, wait. No, look, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what is meant by it's the time base of the system controller. It might make more sense in a second. Um, okay, so um, if we go on to looking at some of the other um, definitions that we have for um, the signal itself or the signal um, phase changes, um, we've got this change and clearance interval. Um, so this is the total length of time um, for yellow and all red signal indicators. So we need to have a certain amount of time in yellow for vehicles to clear the intersection. Um, but also there's uh, a danger if we went straight from um, one signal being red to another signal being green. For that reason, we have what's described below, which is the all red interval. So this is the, um, the period where signals on all approaches to the intersection are showing red. Um, and they're showing red so that we have um, uh, that extra margin of safety against collision. So someone's, um, they've chosen poorly to try and cross the intersection in yellow and they've misjudged it. So the light has gone red and they're still crossing the intersection. But it's okay because the, all the other approaches are also still red. Then they go green after a short period after that. Um, we also have, particularly at night time and in built up areas, um, we can have an all red phase that is just for pedestrians. Um, so um, there's two examples I want to talk about um, here. One is in the center of Ballarat. Um, and you might notice if you ever go out, um, once, once the bars and pubs and clubs reopen and you, you're going out on on an epic post-Rona bender. Um, you can go down to the intersection of Mare Street and Lydiard Street, and you'll notice in the middle of the night that, oh, not in the middle of the night, but you know, say um, 11, 12 p.m., where it, this area is mostly um, you know, used by bar patrons to, to move around, all the lights on approach from Mare Street on the east, from Lydiard Street to the north, Lydiard Street to the south, and from Mare Street to the west, all approaches are red. And they stay red until they detect a vehicle, and then they change to let that vehicle through. And the reason that they're all red is because this is, um, you know, it's obviously that time of night, it's very um, low vehicle volumes, uh, but it's high pedestrian volumes, and particularly it's pedestrians who are uh, intoxicated um, and who may, um, who may be uh, less able to make a, a safe crossing movement. So by making it all red, we're actually promoting the, the safety of pedestrians there. And there's one other point that I want to talk about, and possibly many of you will have seen it. If you've ever traveled into Melbourne to um, Flinders Street Station, I think it is, which one of, it, which one of these is it? It's not, is it Swanson Street? I think it's one of these ones here. It might be this one here. So this intersection in the yeah Elizabeth Street and Flinders Street in Melbourne. Um, we might even be able to get a good street view of it if we go and check this out. Um, if you've been here um, during uh, the week, during the the main days of the week, you may notice that there's certain um, there's a phase in these signals where they go all red for vehicles and all the pedestrian movements open up at once, and you can actually cross from any part to any other part of the intersection. So pedestrians are able to cross diagonally, they're able to cross um, you know, north-south, east-west, they can make any movements, all movements at the same time, um, because there's such a high volume of pedestrians um, that, that move through here from the station to Elizabeth Street to all the, the um, tram stops that are nearby. Absolutely massive pedestrian volume there. Um, 
and that's another potential use for this all red interval. Um, your question four in the key lection, lecture uh, questions is what is the all red interval? Hopefully you can uh, give that a bit of an answer as well. Um, split phase is a part of a phase that is set aside from the primary movement so we are able to um, split uh, rather than having through and through we'll have a split that is through and right and blocks off the opposing through movement as we saw in the last set of slides. Peak hour factor we've also talked about before so this is looking at um, within a the peak hour itself we look at how much um, heavier in traffic flow is the peak 15 minute period. So we take the, um, the peak hour uh, volume um, and we divide by four times the largest peak. Um, I, well you can sort of, either way you look at that, um, at that fraction, you could take it as, um, I think we've seen it previously, uh, reciprocated. So the, the numerator was, um, was the denominator and vice versa. But in either, either case, we're able to measure, um, we're able to look at um, giving us some indication of how much larger is the peak 15 minutes than the rest of the peak hour. Um, so we can, uh, we can also get an idea if we're looking in our signal design, we understand the peak hour factor having an influence on that design, we can um, design our turning lane lengths or we can design our signal timing release periods to account for the fact that we may have these spikes um, in, the, um, uh, in the actual um, typical traffic flow and making sure that we have enough uh, volumes accounted for to, um, to manage that appropriately. Um, all right, so we've got a potential um, few different ways that we can group the signals together. Um, signals can be grouped by lanes. So we can have a lane group that is um, one or more lanes uh, on an approach that has the same green phase. So maybe the left lane, the right lane and the through lane they are all given a green at the same time and they form part of the same lane group. But one of those three lanes will be the critical lane group, which is the lane group that will require the longest time to cross. So maybe the through lane and the left lane, they have low volumes, but at the right turn lane, that's got a high demand. So to clear the right turn lane, it's going to be the longest amount of time. And the um, uh, that will be the critical lane group will be for the right, even though all all of those lanes would have a green um, at the same time because of the way the signals are programmed. Another key definition, saturation flow rate. The flow rate in vehicles per hour that the lane group can carry if it has the green indication continuously. So um, obviously we're not going to have at a signalized intersection green all the time, but this is giving us an idea on what the maximum limits are. And that could be just based on geometry and speed limit. Uh, our peak hour factor was your question five, so just a reminder of that one. And um, uh, question six in your key questions, um, which lane group controls the green time for the signal phase? That is the critical lane group. Um, so we also spoke about um, uh, you know, isolated intersections or coordinated intersections in the last lecture. So if we're talking about signal timing and we're talking about isolated intersections, so something that isn't part of a larger group, um, if this intersection is operating independently, then we, we want a short cycle time to avoid driver frustration. But as we mentioned before, the cycle times that are longer have greater efficiencies. So there's always that, that trade-off. We might, um, you know, in design, we might say, uh, get a spit out from Sidra that says we can get the optimum capacity if we have a three minute cycle time. Um, but for reasons of driver frustration, we, we wouldn't build that. We'll go to no more than two minutes between any particular um, lane light turning green, just because drivers lose their minds if it's any longer than that. Um, we've got a yellow interval, um, which is uh, usually a fixed time. We can calculate that. We're going to see what, um, what possible calculations we have for yellow, but for, um, for safety reasons, we tend to make it pretty consistent. So the yellow case, um, sorry, the yellow interval um, is obviously there to tell motorists that the green light is about to change and give them some indication so that they can decide whether or not they want to cross. Um, but we also, because of the, the presence of a yellow or because of intersection geometry, um, we have a, um, a range of areas that we can, we can think about um, based on our speed approaching the stop line. So if the light changes, if we're traveling along um, and, uh, and we decide that we need to um, 
we, we're sort of watching the signals and we see the light change. At a certain point when we're traveling, we've come too close to the intersection with too much speed and we cannot stop. So we have to go through the intersection. And if we are um, you know, approaching the intersection, um, but we, um, uh, we see that the, the light uh, changes too, too late, we, we want to go across, we are now um, not able to, to go, we're not able to make it before the light changes. What we need to do is make sure that we don't have an overlap in these two areas where the driver can neither stop nor where the driver can, can neither um, uh, continue through. Um, and that's what the yellow phase is, is helpful for doing. It gives us, it basically these, these two cannot stop and cannot go zones are overlapping in theory where there's no, um, where there's no yellow. Um, so if we just, if we had a bad choice of yellow interval or if we had no yellow interval, we would create a dilemma zone. Um, but we can remove this by appropriately providing a yellow. So a little bit of math here on the screen shows that um, we can find the minimum yellow interval in theory by looking at the speed limit, um, by looking at um, uh, you know, what distance we're going to be traveling, um, and it's, it's not too difficult to solve. If we know how wide the intersection is, that tells us how long it takes to cross it. The length of the vehicle adds on to that. It's not a difficult thing to solve. We can, we can find what distance that is, um, which if we plug in some values for the typical widths of intersection and the typical lengths of vehicle, we might find um, this to be you know, some, some fraction of a second, a second and a half or something like that. So as I said, I'm not going to ask you to do the math. We can do the math um, if, in theory if we plug some values in here and we could solve for the minimum distance from the intersection um, that a vehicle would need to, to stop. It, well, sorry, we, we wouldn't be able to stop, right? It cannot go through the intersection without accelerating. Um, so again, we want to eliminate the dilemma zone. We um, we can look at uh, factoring in grade and gravity and and all this sort of stuff, but none of it is particularly uh, relevant because for safety considerations, we would usually have at least three seconds for yellow. So we typically would find with all this stuff that we're going to have uh, some time less than three seconds, unless we have a really long intersection. There are there are a few in the um, in the state. Um, and around Australia where the intersection distance itself, um, you know, if you're crossing uh, a two-lane, oh, sorry, a, um, a two-way highway and that highway each has four lanes or something, you can get to a really long area with a central median and it takes such a long time to cross that we might need four or five seconds. Um, uh, but um, allowing for all of that uh, in general is not necessary, um, so we typically have a three second yellow interval. Um, we typically don't want yellow interval to be made longer than five seconds. Um, it's, uh, it's again, we want motorists to um, recognize that the yellow is quickly representing an oncoming red phase. Um, you can imagine, there's actually been a couple of cases recently um, in Ballarat where we've had some design, um, uh, design questions around allowing for um, shifting an intersection further and allowing for some different movements and we made the decision to remove a movement because it shortened the intersection gave us a, a shorter yellow time um, and reduced the likelihood that vehicles would accelerate when they see a yellow that stays and stays and stays um, if someone is regularly using the same road and they they'll start to learn that that yellow lasts a full five seconds and they'll speed up because they'll, they'll know when they see the yellow that they can speed up and they can make the light. So to avoid that, we say, no, well, let's try to keep the intersection as short as possible, keep the yellow time down, make sure that um, the drivers don't feel tempted to do something silly. Um, we can also increase the all red phase if we need longer uh, yellow time. So if, if we say we typically don't want more than five seconds, but we know that five seconds isn't quite enough for full clearance, then we can use an all red phase. So people still see the light change red, um, but um, they, what they don't realize is that it's actually changed to red on all phases for a longer time so that safety is still maintained, but the, uh, the yellow phase is, um, is preserved for a short period. So question eight, what is the typical minimum and maximum yellow time for a signal phase? That's three seconds for the minimum and five seconds for the maximum, typically. And question seven, what is a dilemma zone? It's on the previous page. That's a, a space where you might not be able to go and you might not be able to stop either. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to drink some water. 
Um, so we discussed before as well intersections, signalise intersections that have a fixed um, time period. So um, the intersection will um, not change depending on any traffic. It will just go through the same loop over and over again. We can also have a semi-actuated or fully actuated system. So sometimes it's only necessary to have, um, uh, this is a detector loop being installed. Um, it's a magnetic um, detector that, that knows when there's steel vehicles passing over the top of it. It sends a signal to the nearby signal controller to tell it that there's something there. Um, and this can be used to uh, either on all approaches, on all legs of an intersection to change dynamically what the um, the movement of vehicles is, the release and, and holding of different uh, lines, change the signals. Or we could have it just on one lane. So maybe um, in general the intersection is fixed, but we have one lane that's only triggered when there's a vehicle there because it has low demand or for some other reason. So um, with our pre-time signals, um, this is just, it's just the same time all the time. Um, if uh, if we if we use that sort of thing, then it's it's fixed um, for the entire day. Or sometimes we might have a change in the peak hour. We go to longer signals, and at the off-peak times, the signal phase is shorter, um, and that's so um, we have a uh, less driver frustration. So Douglas has asked, can those detectors tell if a bicycle or motorbike is there, or only cars? Um, yes, some of them can tell uh, if bicycles are there. They can definitely tell motorbikes. Motorbikes are sort of heavy enough, um, well, not in weight-wise, but they have enough metal and steel um, that they can tell. Uh, there's one at the, the Vic Roads office um, in Wendouree. There's a detector loop inside the car park that lets vehicles out. So you've got to swipe your stuff badge to get in, but getting out, it just uses a detector loop. So if I ride my bike, um, I can actually, if I ride right on the detector loop, it will detect the bike and it will let me out. Um, but uh, you know, if you had a fiberglass bike or something, I'd, I'm not sure if it picks up the metal in my tires, uh, sorry, in the wheels, uh, or if it picks up the frame, I'd be more suspecting that it actually picks up the, um, uh, the metal in the wheels. So um, I make sure that the wheels go right over the, the loop um, and it does actually detect the uh, the bicycle, um, so yeah, they can detect a few things. They work with um, you know if if someone was was um, I don't know why anyone would do this, but say um, if if a uh, a tradie or something was driving along and and uh, a couple of lengths of of steel pole fell out the back of their ute, um, the steel just sitting on the thing would it would register it would trip the meter, so um, that's uh, they they just yeah, they just detect um, metal basically. Not, not all metal has to be ferromagnetic metal, so it wouldn't detect aluminium, but it'll detect steel and tin and other things like that. <clears throat> um, in the last set of slides, I talked about this idea that for every green phase that we have, we actually only have a shorter period within that green phase that is effective um, because we lose a bit of time accelerating, we lose a bit of time decelerating. Um, in the middle, we get up to our saturation flow, and this is our sort of best case. Um, but in the amber phase, we, we drop off, um, and once the light first changes, it takes a while for people to accelerate. Particularly, we get a big drop off if there's a big proportion of heavy vehicles. All right. Um, so in this previous phase, the, the number of vehicles um, that we would get is the area under this curve. That's how many vehicles we'd actually get in terms of rate of vehicles on the vertical axis and time. Vehicles per unit time on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis gives us the total number of vehicles that we can get through. So the higher the saturation flow or the longer the green time, the more we can get out of there. Um, so um, because of that, we know that the effective green time is, is most critical. We want to try and find ways to get the effective green time up as much as we can. Um, if we want to think about how much time is lost by that green, um, then we can sum up the, um, uh, if we take the actual uh, green time for the phase, we subtract the yellow and we, um, we subtract the uh, effective green time, this will give us our total losses. If we sum this across all phases, so we sum across all of the, um, the different cycles, and then we add the all red time during the cycle, this will get us the total time lost. It's not, yeah, not, I wouldn't worry too much about this. It's just general sort of, if you're thinking about signal programming, these are some of the considerations. They're, they're, I, what, they're what I would describe as um, reasonably intuitive if you ever needed to sit down and, 
describe these calculations from scratch. <clears throat> um, so we want to try and distribute that uh, effective green time um, across cycles. Um, we can look at our total losses, we can um, sum up the total amount of red space, and we can work out how much total effective green time we have by, uh, by taking away um, from our actual cycle length all the other losses and things that we have occurred. So this is, um, this is a way of working out the total effective green time, and if we are um, in a position to want to know optimally what the, the, um, the road is doing, then by all means, we can calculate this manually. But typically, as I've said many times before, um, all of this hard work, all the heavy lifting um, in terms of uh, programming signals and determining the, the flow rates um, and that sort of thing uh, are done by computer software. So it, it's an exercise um, these days, it's an exercise in putting in all of the values of, of flow rate, all of your known demands, um, and all of your lane lengths and that sort of thing. Um, and you tell the program to calculate, it'll work out your your delays on different approaches. It can find optimum signal times for you. Um, it can do a lot of uh, a lot of good work. Um, so we want to make sure that um, if we we want to get the overall uh, minimum overall delay. Um, so we want that total effective green time to be distributed among different phases. We don't want the effective green time to be just maximized in um, uh, for one phase. We want to make sure the effective green time um, is maximized across all of the uh, all the other approaches to the roundabout. So we want to make sure that we we get a good um, proportional spread, um, which we can sort of visualize by looking at the um, the green time, the actual green time for a particular um, intersection. Oops, for a particular um, phase, um, should be the proportion of vehicles coming from that phase multiplied by the total green time, a total effective green time um, divided by the sum of across all. Um, all phases. So, yeah, again, um, I think that's in somewhat intuitive, but also don't worry about ever having to do that math. Um, you'll you'll use Sidra in reality, and uh, and it will do it for you. Um, all right. So, what else do we have? We have this concept of a minimum green time, um, which can be defined in a couple of ways. So, one of the, the ways that we can have a minimum green time is from pedestrians. So wherever pedestrians are crossing, we need the pedestrians to be able to cross the intersection um, safely. They've got a limited walking speed. Um, pedestrians have also a, um, you know, they've got a fixed width of the intersection that they need to cross. Um, another interesting fact about pedestrians is that they do not queue. So if, if you've got a vehicle waiting at an intersection and then five more vehicles arrive behind it, um, those vehicles form a queue and the ones behind cannot go until after the first one has had time to go. And if you add another 10 vehicles, eventually you reach a saturation point where um, a vehicle will wait, uh, the light will change, the vehicle won't get through the queue, and the vehicle will have to wait for two cycles to get through. But that property is not true for pedestrians. Pedestrians don't queue, they spread. Pedestrians will spread and get wider and wider around an intersection, and then as soon as the light changes, all the pedestrians cross at the same time. They move they move as one, they move in one big unit, um, and you, this is really visible at, um, at Southern Cross uh, interse Southern Cross um, Station, uh, it's the intersection of Spencer Street and um, Collins Street in Melbourne. You'll see um, pedestrians uh, bunch up and bunch up and group and group, um, and then when the lights change, you get movements of hundreds of pedestrians in a single um, pedestrian cycle. Um, so we also have a uh, minimum green time that may be um, uh, yeah, higher than needed for vehicular traffic because of the pedestrians. Um, and, um, and I think other than that, we would need some minimum amount of green time to, uh, to label a heavy vehicle to get, to get across. If we know that a heavy vehicle has a defined acceleration and travel rate um, and a defined length and the intersection has a defined length, all of these things would give us a minimum green time for a heavy vehicle as well. Um, all right, we've got um, a couple of questions that we've just come past in our key lecture questions. So question 10, uh, why is the effective green time less than the true green time? So this has to do with losses because of acceleration, because of decision making, because of the all red, and because of the yellow phase. 
Um, question 11, why can the min green time be longer than needed for vehicles to leave the intersection? As we just discussed, it has to do with pedestrians. Um, and question 12 is just about to come up here. What is the difference between a permitted turn and a protected turn? So we've got permitted movements, uh, protected movements, and permissive movements. Um, so permitted um, movements are those where we don't have particular um, protection, we don't have particular phasing that tells us what to do. Here I've shown a traffic signal that just has um, green, yellow, red. Um, you can imagine we might have a left turn, a through movement, and a right turn at this intersection, um, but we're not actually showing um, any of the, the particular phases. We're basically saying it's green, if you want to turn right, find a gap. The traffic signal is only telling you it's green for through movements and it's green for left turn movements. Um, as long as there isn't a conflicting pedestrian movement, you can turn left. But the right turn movement, this will depend on um, you having a gap in traffic. We have also protected turns. So here you might have seen um, signals like this, where there is uh, movements for through. The left movement is implied. We don't show it there again, because most of the time the left movement is green when the main arrow is green. But the right movement is uh, fully protected. We have a, a red phase that tells us you cannot turn right. We have yellow and we have green for right. Um, and so when we're waiting, we're looking at these things, we're able to make our movement um, where the signal does the job of, of protecting us. We don't have to wait for a gap. The signals will change to red for the, the uh, movement that's going to cross our right turn. Then it will let our right turn change green. And while we need to be careful and still look for oncoming traffic, the signal will make a gap for us. And we also have this hybrid, the protected protected slash permissive. So this one has uh, green and yellow for the um, uh, the right turn, but it has no red. So what this means is that at any time, it when it is safe to do so, you can make a right turn. So unlike this one, this is fully telling you when the arrow is red, I don't care if no one's coming, you're not going. That's why we have this red arrow here. This one's saying, yep, it, I'll give you a green signal every now and again, um, but if you don't have a green signal, as long as this one is green, it's okay for you to make a, uh, a right turn here when, it is, when there's a safe gap. Um, as I mentioned before, this is misreading a signal like this um, is what caused the first traffic accident that, uh, that I was ever in. Okay, um, how are we going for time? Yeah, so we've got 10 slides left, um, which we will uh, we'll punch through, I think, without a break, um, and then we will we'll finish up the lecture content for today. I'll talk a bit about the next assignment after that. Um, I, I started writing it last night, I didn't quite get it finished, or at least I'm not, not happy with it yet, so I'll do a little bit more work on it today, and then I'll put it up online, but I'll talk a bit about how it's going to work anyway. Um, so phase plans are needed to, uh, to basically show how the traffic signals are going to function on paper. Once everyone's happy with the way that the traffic signals will function on paper, then they can be sent to, uh, to actually have the signal controller manufactured and programmed um, and eventually installed. Um, so we have a, um, uh, a couple of different ways of, or a couple of different things that we're trying to get out of this plan. We want to look at the optimum use of the effective green time. We want to see that the, the order of the, uh, the phase plan is showing us how everything's going to move and that we're going to have the least amount of wasted space in the signal. Uh, we have really simple signal phase plans, which are just two phase plans, like on the next slide. Pardon me. Um, we also have... Um, uh, some series with, if, if we note that there's um, more phases, if there's four or five or six phases, um, that's going to mean more total time lost in the cycle. Because every time we change phases, we need a yellow, we need a red, we need an all red, and we need um, the, uh, the sort of losses of acceleration and deceleration in there as well. So a simple two phase system, this is a sort of permitted uh, permitted sort of turn system, north-south goes and everything else is permitted, east-west goes and everything else is permitted, and we can just go back and forth between these two. Um, here we've got um, the left turn, now in Australia it would be uh, right turn um, movement, so we have one that's got an opposed right turn, um, and then we have the through protected, and then we have the opposite. Um, I'm not going to go in full detail into all of these, but you can see there's a number of different ways that we can arrange uh, these, 
uh, these phases um, and again we're striving for for allowing all of the movements uh, we want to use the least total number of changes um, and we also want to make sure that we aren't um, uh, using the particular phases out of proportion so in this simple two phase area um, if we had 90% um, of the demand on this road was from the east but we are providing the full movement east-west and maybe no one can really turn left across this um, this east movement because there's so many vehicles so really we need a different phase set up there we need to make sure that we're thinking about um, providing a the fewest total number of changes but also accounting for the demand and doing that appropriately as well Um, so if we are lucky enough to have actuated traffic signals, then the cycle lengths can be changed. So fixed or pre-timed signals cannot adjust themselves, but if we have actuated signals, the vehicles arriving at the intersection are picked up by detectors. As we mentioned before, they can be in the pavement or they can be overhead. The overhead ones um, are more expensive to install at present because they're newer technology, um, but they have the advantage that they are safer to maintain. So to maintain these ones in the road, for a start, you've got to cut the road surface, which is never a good thing. Um, cutting the road then means you've got a place where water can get in, um, but you have to close a lane or you have to otherwise have workers in the lane itself, which is not great. If you have the cameras, the cameras can be located off to one side and they can be programmed to pick up different lanes and they're much safer for people to, to work on. So um, where we can, we prefer the cameras these days. I think we're going to, probably in the next few years uh, require only cameras, um, but uh, there is definitely almost all of the, um, the detecting, uh, all of the actuation um, in the state at the moment is done with detector loops that are in the ground. <coughs> um, so by measuring the, uh, the presence of cars, by counting the number of cars, the controller can calculate the demand in real time and it can it can adjust the, the length of the cycles so demand um, this is the, the the amount of vehicles coming through with a request for a right-of-way someone saying yep I want to be let through um, demand for that motion the initial portion this is um, the first part of the green phase um, so we've got uh, a few more definitions of the way that signals function here so we've got this first part of a green phase um, that that we're always going to run even if we're using an actuated um, signal if we've detected one car the initial portion and the, and the minimum portion um, we're going to have a, a certain minimum amount of green time even if only one car was detected and that tends to be programmed based on things we mentioned before like the time it takes for one truck to cross an intersection or the time it takes for pedestrians to cross at the same time on the same phase um, so there there are some minimums here and there are some um, uh, some sort of some counting there's a bit of programming that, that we've got to think about um, if you try to think like a computer um, in these things so in the initial portion as well um, we will release a vehicle in green but we don't know if there is another vehicle waiting between the detector and the stop line so we need to give some more time um, for the part of that green phase um, before the the um, uh, the controller can end um, I'll go to some of the next slides as well. We'll start to think a bit more about how the um, how the signal controlling works. So we've got an extendable portion as well, which is this is how much longer we can make the green signal. We've got the the choice, so we tell the signal programmer um, you can use up to an extra 30 seconds at that you tell it at minimum you have to use 15 seconds. You can add an extra 30 seconds if there are vehicles that keep arriving, and we also have. Um, a, a sort of a unit extension if you see down here this unit extension um, this is basically saying okay how long does it take um, one vehicle to pass the detector and then a second follow-up vehicle to pass it so you wouldn't extend every time you detect a vehicle coming through you don't extend for 0.01 seconds you have to extend for the amount of time it takes for a following vehicle to come up otherwise you would say yeah we're extending 
and then you'd say, oh, there's no more vehicles detected after 0.01 seconds, let's change to red, but actually there was a queue that didn't have time to get up to the detector. So we allow for this in unit extension, every time we hit um, the actuator, every time a new vehicle is detected, the unit extension gets reset, uh, and so we extend a bit more and a bit more until we get to that extension limit. Once we've reached the limit of extension, then regardless of whether or not there are more vehicles waiting, we give priority to another phase, and so we keep the intersection moving that way. Semi-actuated signals. We've got question 13. How are semi-actuated signals different from fully actuated signals? Um, the simplest way is that we don't have detectors on all approaches. Um, in semi-actuated signals, we use detectors only in the minor traffic stream. Um, so we can basically have the primary stream, the major stream vehicles, have green all of the time. And they only uh, pardon me, <laughs> change to red if the minor tr stream traffic is detected. So um, this is very useful when we wouldn't normally install signals, say we didn't have enough volume on the minor stream, but because there is so much flow on the major stream, minor stream movements are unsafe or they are, yeah, they're causing frustration, they're causing delays. So we might put them on there when we've got small volumes, but we'll trigger them just when, when needed. It can be a really good way to improve safety. Um, <coughs> so because these are actuated only by the side road, um, we only need to meet the demand on the minor approach and everything else can stay based on the uh, green for the major approach. If we have um, you know, peak periods on the minor stream, um, in those cases, the signal would act like a pre-timed one. It would keep cycling through phases. But once the minor stream traffic trailed off back down to a low volume or no volume, then we would go back to fully green on the major road. Oh, question 14 as well. Why is there a minimum unit extension of traffic signal time? Pardon me, of traffic signal green time. That unit extension, as we mentioned before, has to do with vehicles um, that are leaving um, the, the detector pad. We need enough time for a follow-up vehicle to also reach the detector pad. Okay. Um, so um, we've got some other um, discussions about signal setting. Um, so if we... If we're talking about, um, I think this is still talking about the semi-actuated signals. So we set them so that the green signal in the major approach um, is set on for a minimum period. So the major approach always has a minimum, but it just won't change until it's actuated by a minor stream vehicle. Um, if we have a uh, greater than or equal to the minimum um, time for the green to be on for the major road, and we detect a vehicle on the side road, then we can change uh, change the signals. Um, the green signal on the minor stream will come on for at least the minimum, but it will it will not stay on after that. So even if there were no vehicles on the major stream and lots of vehicles on the side road, it would eventually change back to a priority for the major road. And then detecting the minor vehicles again once this condition um, has been met and we've we've reached at least the minimum, then we once again release vehicles from the minor road. So pretty um, pretty efficient way to do things. I think it's it's pretty clear when you think through um, each of the ways that it has to work. Um, so we want to make sure that we we set the times for the initial portion, unit extension, and maximum green time um, for all the minor stream stuff. For the major streams, we want uh, the minimum green um, times to be properly programmed. But we don't need to worry about the other times. We don't need to think about an extension limit. We don't need to think about um, an extension interval because the major stream is going to stay on permanently until we have a detection on the side road. Um, we also need to note a pedestrian clearance if we have pedestrian actuators. So that's, those are the buttons. Although we are, um, there's new technology coming out that doesn't actually use a button press for pedestrians that uses again cameras and the cameras are in some ways better than the um, the detectors the old detectors uh, because the camera can count the number of pedestrians so the camera can actually say oh well, here's 10 pedestrians who just arrived in a big group let's give the 10 pedestrians a higher priority than the one or two cars on the road 
whereas the buttons can only detect a single press, which could be from one people or it could be from a hundred people, doesn't know. This is all coming about, by the way, all of this pedestrian counting and vehicle counting because of the rise in machine learning uh, artificial intelligence. If you've ever filled out uh, a capture, so um, on a website when it asks you to prove you're not a robot and click on the little buttons that contain vehicles or the, the little squares that contain you know, traffic signals or anything else, that's teaching robots to see um, teaching robots to see and recognize cars and see and recognize people and um, and that's uh, yeah some of the technology has now enabled us to to count pedestrians in groups um, the unit extension speed um, or the unit extension extension time um, as you might have guessed would be a function of speed we need to think about the time it takes for vehicles moving at the average speed um, from the detectors to the stop line so if they're queued up how long does it take each successive vehicle to get through to cross the detector line um, yeah we're not going to need to do this calculation but again I would hope you think that's reasonably intuitive as to how you would work it out um, <clears throat> so um, as we discussed before we we need to um, at least allow the, the vehicle to come up behind. We need to also enable, enable that vehicle to clear the intersection, um, although as we discussed earlier, part of this uh, clearance time can also be in the yellow phase if we have a much shorter um, grouping of cars crossing over the detector as well. Some more discussion of the initial portion. So we want to make sure this initial portion is long enough um, that vehicles between the stop line and the detector during the red phase are able to clear the intersection. Um, so we need um, we need that time for um, all the vehicles that are um, that have you know waited until the red basically um, are, are able to get through. So they need to be um, uh, if they, if they're in the opposite uh, direction if they're crossing the phase that we're looking at. Um, that's when they're going to need to have at least enough time to get through that red phase. Um, so we need to know um, how many vehicles are waiting, um, how much distance are there between following vehicles, and what's the starting delay in those vehicles taking off. Um, so we can work out if we multiply um, the average time headway by the number of vehicles and we add on the starting delay, then we're able to work out what this initial portion is the minimum green time then becomes the sum of the initial portion um, and the unit extension. Where we have large changes in traffic volumes, especially throughout a day, um, there's lots of places in Melbourne uh, are like this and quite a few around Ballarat as well and other places in, in the state obviously, um, then fully actuated signals are the best kind of signals because we're able to get the um, maximum minimum green time set but all the other particular phases are changed by um, detecting vehicles, counting vehicles. Um, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. You, there's, because I mentioned before, all of the signals are um, sent back to, or linked up to the Telstra network. You can actually remotely look into, um, I don't have the clearance for it, but it's possible to look into um, how each uh, of a particular traffic signals are performing in real time. And you can see, um, you know, that one intersection that's several hundred kilometers from where you are sitting, you can see if it's currently um, red on approach from this intersection or green on approach from that intersection. You can even see it live detecting cars. You can see it counting the current rate of cars on approach to the intersection. Um, it's um, yeah. So there's lots of ability for traffic controllers to, um, to modify these things in a coordinated way to help cities um, and towns function better. Um, and uh, and yeah, lots of lots of hard work goes into optimizing these networks. Okay, um, that's it for um, this set of slides. Um, what I'm going to do for the next, or what I'm immediately going to do now, is is show you the uh, the next assignment, or at least in its current form. Um, as I mentioned before, I've um, uh, I've got to do a little bit more work. I'm not I'm not quite comfortable with um, the direction, I don't think it's quite clear yet, and the values that we're getting don't don't seem as um, they don't seem as intuitive as they should. I don't want to give you an assignment where you make some calculations and you're very confused because it doesn't look right. So um, trying to trying to get that fixed up so that the values appear a bit more 
uh, reasonable. So I'm mucking around with uh, values in a spreadsheet to get that to work. But um, anyway, the next exercise is going to be a traffic impact assessment report. Um, it'll be worth 10% uh, of the unit um, and it's due on the 4th of June. So you've got um, four weeks or so. Uh, 4th of June is uh, yeah about four weeks away. It's a single assignment, individual assignment. So basically what we're going to be doing in this assignment is um, we are uh, imagining that there is a retail shopping center that is being constructed at the intersection of uh, Creswick Road and Norman Street in Ballarat. So that's... Um, how far out have I zoomed? Not far enough. Ballarat. Uh, Creswick Road and Norman Street is here. So you can see currently it's a big vacant lot, Creswick Road and Norman Street. Um, it's probably going to maintain a, be a vacant lot for a while longer, but uh, it's going to be developed into something after that. Um, and uh, we, in this exercise, we're proposing that this part of the world is going to be made into a shopping centre. Um, so we need a traffic impact assessment report to be prepared for that shopping centre. We're going to have multiple accesses on the major and minor roads. Um, and um, we're going to have one access that is catering for all movements. So one, one access that has left in, left out, right in, and right out. And one access that is left in, left out only. And that's from both roads. So on Norman Street, oops, if I go back to here, just didn't mean to open that. Um, on Norman Street, we'll have one left in, left out. We'll have one left in, left out, right in, right out. Um, and we'll have the same from Creswick Road as well, just because I want to make lots of um, lots of intersections to check. Um, and um, we're going to have on-site parking that we need to calculate. Um, so details of the shopping centre area, um, other relevant details, those will come from a spreadsheet. So similar to other ones that I've worked out before, I'm just in the process of trying to get these numbers right so that they they appear valuable or they appear reasonable when you put your student numbers in um, and to make sure that you calculate the right sort of things for um, parking and that, that and so forth. I'm going to um, you know delete all of that part when I give you the assignment so that they won't have the answers in it. Uh, and then you can work out how much traffic is going to Creswick Road and Norman Street and so on. So if I put in my student number, I can see all the different areas. Um, you'll be able to use the um, report from what's it called? The guide to traffic generating um, guide to traffic generating developments. This will be your guide for figuring out um, how much traffic is generated, um, how much parking is required, all that sort of thing. So note that there is um, section three has land use traffic generation. We, we are talking about a retail shopping centre, so you need to go to section 3.6.1. <coughs> and to work out the parking requirements, we've got a section of parking here, which also has a discussion on um, retail shopping centres. Um, but also we've got a section on um, car parking for delivery services as well. So I want you to calculate how much parking do we need for deliveries? How much parking do we need for service vehicles? Also, how much parking do we need for our customers? So make sure you check all of those things. Um, so, uh, yep, that's part of the other requirements. Um, so students will need to review the existing traffic, parking and transport conditions surrounding the site. So have a look on, on the website, um, have a look on the map. What's the parking like around here? You know, is there existing parking? Yeah, it looks like there is existing parking on Norman Street. What are the traffic arrangements like? Describe the nearby intersections. Those are some of the things that um, that we want to see in here. Um, I want you to review the planning scheme. If you don't know what the planning scheme is, or you don't know how to review it, go to this website, Planning Maps Online. I've given you a link there. That's where you can find planning scheme information. Also, to make sure that you're not too lost. In what to do, I'll put an example traffic impact assessment report on Moodle, so you can get a look for um, for what they what they generally look like, um, what sort of things are generally in them, um, and you'll get a bit of an idea on, on how uh, how comments or wh where things like the planning scheme um, review gets commented on. Make sure I've still got that open. Yep. Um, so uh, I want you to calculate parking demand, as we just talked about, um, look at traffic generation, and to determine the turning lane warrants. So um, if you recall back from um, our lecture 
earlier, a lecture four, we talked about turning lane warrants. So these curves that show uh, major road and minor road traffic volumes and vehicles per hour. Um, and we're able to see if we fall in different areas, what the, um, the sort of uh, the required turning lane is. Is it a basic auxiliary turn? Is it a channelized turn? Um, so I want you to use these curves, plot a few of these curves in your report to state whether the turns should be um, you know, auxiliary or major or channelized or so on. Some tips here, um, I want this to be presented as a, a typical formatted report. So um, we want your introductions, your conclusions, your main body. Um, I want to see any calculations accompanied with an explanation. So please explain where your calculations are coming from. Make references to the standards. So make references to the guide to traffic generating developments. Um, include images as appropriate. Um, and uh, yeah, if you do all of those things, you'll get full marks. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, and I'll be happy to to help you out with that. Um, make good note as well. Um, next week at um, let me see if I go over to Moodle. I do want to extend my session if that's going to stay on. My session is timed out. Fantastic. I've got to log in again. Maybe I don't have to log in if it's not going to time me out. So. Um, uh, we've got uh, a Discord class with Hayden, 9.30 on the 15th of May. If you need help with your assignment, that would be an excellent time to jump onto Discord. Um, last week, Hayden didn't have any students um, coming in for, for class, so I take it that that means you are all perfectly across all of your requirements. You don't have any outstanding questions. You know everything that you're doing, uh, which is wonderful, but if that happens to not be the case, please make sure that you do... Um, jump into that Discord class and get some help. Um, our following lecture, um, so the live, the next live stream will be the 22nd of May. Um, I've got a scheduling conflict with my other job, so we'll actually start that at 11.30, not at 10.30 as well. So please take note of those things. Um, otherwise, I hope you are um, finding this subject informative and interesting. Um, and um, let me know if there's any questions.